Episode 341, Caught Between the Two. Andres really disliked the two of them. They were out to snatch his mommy. Andres called out softly, Mommy? He saw a fleeting figure from his periphery. When he looked up, his father was already sitting beside him, his palm tenderly patting his adorable little crown. Angry? Andres sulkily ignored him by looking to the other side. Stefan pinched his chin and forced him to turn his head in his direction. Daddy is talking to you now. It is impolite to ignore Daddy, you know? The boy snickered. Have I ever acknowledged you as my Daddy? I think your hat is too big for your hat. His indomitable and proud temperament was akin to his mother's. I think you're just shy. I'm definitely not. Andres. The man found the boy to be ineffably adorable when he saw. Can you cook for Daddy in the future? Is that a deal? Not at all. I only cook for Mommy. So don't even think about it. He stuck his tongue out at his father defiantly. Mm. Dream on. Looking down calmly at the boy, his father deftly caught his little pinkish tongue with a pair of chopsticks. This man is a sadist. Is it interesting to make fun of me in this way? Yes, it is interesting. The man seemed to know what he was thinking about as he gave this answer neutrally. Stefan, you're a sadist? It's not cute when a child speaks like that. Besides, if I'm a sadist, what does that make you? If he was a sadist, then as his child, shouldn't that make him a little sadist? Truth be told, sometimes, he did wonder if the son of his had been through a genetic mutation. If not, then why was he so different from the rest? The little lad gave him an unexpected reply. I'm different from you. I'm a genius. You're old, crazy, and the worst of all sadists. The man asked in return, Shouldn't you thank my genes for making you a genius? Thank you? If not for your genes, I might even be more exceptional. Shouldn't you thank me, too, for looking so adorable? Stefan, can you open your eyes wider to have a better look? I inherited my mommy's good looks. I despise yours. You're so smart. It's all thanks to me. Then can you explain why Sam is so stupid? The older boy was startled to hear his name being called when he was only eating his food quietly at one side. He did not know how he could be shot when he was not doing anything. His father refuted indignantly, He's not stupid at all. He was about to use his toes to count when I asked him to add up 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6. I'm smart because my mommy has taught me well. I'm unlike Sam. In fact... I'm being made stupid by him. His older brother's little pinkish face grimaced, clearly greatly hurt by this remark. The father and son started bickering in this way. Stefan realized, with some frustration, that although he might consider himself as vicious, he could hardly compare to his younger son in this aspect. There was a saying, the older, the wiser. This meant being more capable as well as more vicious. Well, in this case, he was going to get buried by this tender boy's viciousness soon. Andres' vicious words were the most extreme. He suspected that this little lad already had the gift of malicious gab even before he was born. The boy could rebut his every word unapologetically. His son was really invincible. The mother's lips twitched for a second before she tried to stop them. Both of you, stop fooling around. Mommy, you don't want Andres now, right? The boy complained with much displeasure. Mommy, Andres wants a hug. Her eyes shifted. She was about to make her way to him when Sam started to clamor for the same thing. Mommy, Sam wants a hug too. Mommy, hug, hug. The younger twin repeated with a pout. Mommy, Hug! Hug! The older twin's voice cracked with his plea. Their mother was rather disturbed and lost with two little fellows by now. She could not split herself between the two 
when both wanted her at the same time. She knew very well that Andres was still resentful of their two visitors. Still, it was not the little lad's fault for feeling this way and for being difficult now. In their family, for six years, there was only Andres and her. Thus, it was only natural for her son to deem this father and son pair as intruders. In fact, the boy was full of resentment and resistance. This was not what she wanted to see. She really wanted the brothers to love each other and get along with each other. A gulf must exist now between the two siblings after six years of estrangement. The older brother seemed to like his younger brother a lot, but the latter refused to let anyone in his heart. She sipped her lips and considered hard. This was something she had no experience in. Both sons were equally important to her, and she wanted to protect and love the two. Getting caught between the two like this was not a situation she wanted to be in. Andres fluttered his eyelids as his mother hesitated. Unlike when he sulked in the past, this time she did not immediately go up to him, carried him, and consoled him. The knowledge that she was concerned for his older brother actually disappointed him. Thus, his tender face started to show his vexation. Everything seemed to dim before him as mist cooled in his eyes. He reckoned himself to be number one in his mommy's heart, someone irreplaceable. He thought that he was someone no one could replace in his mother's heart, like she was to him. His mommy was the most important person in his life. Why, then, was he not the most important in his mommy's heart? Mommy, have you stopped loving Andres? He pouted in petulance as tears overflowed from his eyes down to his cheeks. Mommy is the most important person in Andres' heart. But Mommy has stopped loving Andres. His soft lip flaps sit tightly against each other as he put on a stubborn front despite his tearful face. His mother hastily explained, That's not true at all. Mommy still loves Andres. It's just that... Her pretty brows frowned as she glanced helplessly at her older son. Sam's eyes rimmed red with hurt. He loved his brother a lot. Thus, he did not want his brother to grieve. He was not out to fight with his brother for their mother's attention. He was only teasing his younger sibling moments before. Of course, he also wanted to take this chance to draw closer to their mother. His daddy told him that this woman was his biological mother, and this child beside her was his biological brother. They were finally reunited after six years of separation. Unfortunately, this brother of his did not seem to welcome them. He had built a bulwark around him instead. He really did not know how to break down that wall. What should he do? He sheepishly approached his brother. Standing beside him, his little hand tugged at Andre's sleeve in hopes of arousing his attention. Instead, his younger twin retreated a step from him. Seeing his brother distancing himself from him, he started to sob in despair. His little face turned ruddy as he cried out, Brother! Episode 342 Older Brother Will Not Do It Again The words that came out of Sam's mouth were like the buzzing of a fly. They were barely audible. He had always been easily made embarrassed. One could even say that he was a child who lacked initiative. Despite his innate shyness, he was still taking the initiative to be near his younger twin now. He was even trying to engage him in a conversation. Alas, Andres was still cold to him, and avoided his attempt at intimacy. Sam felt so wronged. Little brother, I... I like you. These last three words were uttered so softly they could barely be heard. I like you. Sam wanted to confess this aloud. He did not want his little brother to alienate him. 
he would not fight with him for their mommy. Just like his mommy, he intended to protect and love Andres properly. Would that not be great? We... we are... Sam's face turned red and was fluster. He wanted to say it urgently, but his anxiety was making his speech slightly incoherent. Inside, he kept saying the same words. We are family. We are family. I'm your brother, and you're mine. We are family. I'll dote on you and protect you, just like Mommy does. You'll never ever be bullied by anyone again. Unfortunately for him, Andres, who was feeling despondent, stood at the side throughout this. His gaze was elsewhere, and he refused to look at any of them. Monica could not stand it anymore. She walked over and crouched next to him. When she saw him biting his lower lip sullenly, she tried to coax him out of it. Andres, stop being so willful. I am not. He looked up at her with his eyes full of emotion and helplessness. Mommy, I don't want a daddy, and I don't want a brother. I only want you. I don't want them. Sam was stupefied, and as if struck by lightning, he felt his body turn cold and rigid. As for Stefan, he was still calm and composed. He had already expected this kind of reaction from the boy. The level of possessiveness the child had for his mother was exceptionally strong. He was a paranoid child. No one could change his mind once he decided to believe a certain truth. Monica had never thought that this child would have such a stubborn side. It was aggravating, yet humorous. Andres, be good. Let's not cause a scene, okay? I'm not causing a scene. Andres refuted helplessly while hugging her tightly. I don't like them. I tried accepting them before, but Andres couldn't do it. I only want mommy. Having mommy is enough for me. Is having Andres not enough for mommy? Andres can protect mommy, take care of mommy, and love mommy. Andres. Monica let out a deep sigh as she held her forehead. She felt a slight ache in her heart. She had never seen Andres this frantic before. There was panic and fear in his eyes, as if he were about to lose her. He was clearly in despair. He was not going to lose her, though. Even with the addition of a daddy and an older brother to accompany him and dote on him, her love for him would never decrease. Was this not great? Andres, he's your older brother. He will dote on you and love you, just like Mommy always does. Sam bobbed his head fervently, his pressing gaze instantly filling with hope. Even a small nod from his younger sibling, he would already be over the moon and would embrace him tightly. Following her statement, Andres shifted his gaze onto his older twin, who was standing behind her. This child had the same appearance and features as him. Even in twins, it was rare to find a pair with identical features. They seemed to be cast in the same mold. If the two of them were to stand next to each other, regardless of height, it would be hard to tell them apart. Ultimately, he shook his head in disappointment and proceeded to close his eyes. He appeared to be trying to escape this reality. Feeling slightly helpless, she feigned her anger. If Andres continues to be so headstrong, Mommy is going to be angry. Mommy is fierce. Andres' clear and distinct eyes gazed at her with silent accusation. Andres is disobedient. She huffed and eyed him with a frown. He had never seen his mother look so angry before. All this time, she was as gentle as calm water. She had also never raised her voice at him before. But because of them, he was told off for being disobedient. When was he disobedient? Andres pursed his lips as he clenched and unclenched his fist. He replied with much indignation and pain. Mommy is a dummy. Andres is going to stop caring about mommy. As soon as he said that, 
The peeved little boy ran back into his bedroom. With a pong, the door was slammed shut. In the living room, the three of them could only look at one another in dismay as helpless smiles hung on their lips. Sam asked sadly, Mommy, is little brother upset because of me? In the bedroom, Andres buried himself under the blankets. Underneath the sheets, he curled his tiny body into a ball like a feeble baby and hugged himself tightly. Even though his tears had all dried up, his heart still felt as if it had been ripped apart by a sharp object and was now dripping with blood. Someone opened his bedroom door slowly and approached his bed with soft footfalls. Was it Mommy? Was she here to comfort him because she was afraid that he was angry and hurt? He carefully lifted the corners of his blankets, only to see Sam's bright and sunny smile. It was as if a huge hole had split open the depths of darkness. Sunshine seeped and shone through the cracks, spreading its warmth everywhere. The lad in bed was startled into opening his wide eyes. Andres, the boy carefully called out his name with a face full of gentleness, which made the lad in the bed feel his heart waver. The grievance he felt lessened. What? I... The boy gritted his teeth, and with resolution, he said awkwardly, I like you, Andres. I know. Andres hummed with slight pride. Seemingly feeling embarrassed, he hurriedly hid his face under his blankets again. His beautiful face began to flush due to his older brother's shy confession. His older twin grabbed the corners of the blankets and smiled. It is okay if you don't like me. I will protect you. You're afraid that I will fight with you over mommy, right? The little guy beneath the covers refused to make a sound. Blinking his eyes, he smiled. Don't worry, I won't fight you for mommy. As I am your older brother, I will give in to you regardless of anything. I don't need you to give in to me, the little guy hidden under the blanket said in a muffled voice. Since mommy has always been mine, huh? I know. The older twin was happy that his younger twin was finally willing to speak to him. Meeting his younger brother for the first time had him feeling a strange yet wonderful sensation. This child had spikes all over his body, just like a little hedgehog. But Sam still developed an attachment to him. He liked him. He liked this little brother since their first meeting. He was smart and adorable. Although he might have a poisonous tongue at times and would set difficult math questions to make fun of him, he was still extremely taken by this smart and adorable little fellow. Little brother, please don't be angry. It's my fault today. I only wanted to tease you, but I made you upset instead. Older brother won't do it again. The younger twin was astounded by his sincere promise. He was truly quite shocked. Without noticing it, his older brother's love and gentleness had slightly melted the thick layer of ice surrounding his heart. Episode 343, Distance of Martin Separated by the blankets, Sam opened his arms and hugged his brother with much care. Feeling his closeness under the covers, Andres' face turned redder. His older brother's hug made him feel so nervous, he did not know where to place his arms. Following this was a long, stifling silence. After an unknown amount of time had passed, a box was squeezed in front of one of the comers of the blanket. The content of the box was unknown. Only his twin's cheerful and reassuring voice was heard. Now, this is your older brother's gift for you. He had specially prepared this for his younger twin before coming over. A present for his little brother. The boy retreating footsteps were heard outside the covers. 
Immediately after, the sound of the door softly closing was heard. Andres popped his head out of his blankets. He took out the box that his older brother had stuffed under his covers. Under the light, he could see that it was a beautifully wrapped gift. Was this a present? That guy was rather diligent. It seemed that he was not as annoying as he had imagined. His eyes turned into crescent moons as a smile unknowingly decorated his lips. As he held the gift in his palm, he was still unaware that his lips started lifting at the corner from the pleasure and contentment he was feeling. Sam sat in the passenger seat of the car on the way home after dinner. In a great mood, the corners of his lips remained arched upward throughout the ride. Stefan glanced at his son from his periphery and could not help but ask, What present did you give your little brother? It's a secret. I will never tell daddy. The boy made a face at him as he continued to withhold the nature of his gift. Thereafter, he bashfully said, Little brother will definitely like my gift. It appears that your little brother doesn't like you, though, teased his father. My little brother will definitely like me. Definitely. He solemnly made this vow as he leaned on the window ledge, gazing up at the bright moon hanging in the sky. Later that night, just before turning off the lights, Monica walked into the bedroom only to see Andre still resting against the headboard. He was fiddling with the delicate gift in his hands. The present was still beautifully wrapped. Even if his heart refused to admit it, in actual fact, he could not bear to tear open his gift. She approached his bed. The boy quickly regained his senses and hid the gift under his pillow. He looked up at her with weariness. Is it a gift from your older brother? She asked. Yep. He licked his lips lightly and sheepishly gave an excuse for his endeavor. I dislike it a lot, but I find it rather amusing. Mommy's rather curious about what he gave you. She deliberately tested him. Why don't we open it and have a look? No. He stared at her guardedly. The wrapping is kind of interesting. What a stubborn little boy. The fact was that he could not bear to unwrap it. She pursed her lips into a smile instead of exposing his thoughts. This child was indeed a little petulant. One could tell that he actually really liked the gift. The feelings of nervousness, anticipation, and curiosity were clearly written all over his face. However, his character could be awkward at times and he was not always that great at expressing himself. She caressed his delicate face lovingly, pinching his chubby cheeks. She pursed her lips and said, Mommy loves Andres. The spot Andres has in Mommy's heart can never be replaced by anyone. He embraced her and planted a sweet kiss on her cheek. Andres loves Mommy too. Mommy's place is Andres' heart is irreplaceable. Sleep early. She stroked his hair before she gave him a kiss on his forehead. You have to get up early tomorrow. Okay. As she was leaving the bedroom, the smile on her face gradually faded away. This child clearly still harbored some resistance in his heart. Currently, she was at her wit's end. The shooting of the film was making good headway. There were some scenes regarding the main storyline of the grown-up Nathan Stark and Diana Stark, and the production team rushed to Foxcom Tower to capture the needed shots for these. This was not because James was being frugal with the expenses, but rather because in the novel, Nathan Stark had joined a media company after graduation. In all aspects, Foxcom's headquarters was extremely compatible with the novel's plot requirements. In this specific scene, after graduation from high school, the two's parents started to notice that the relationship between Nathan and Diana had crossed the boundaries of mere siblings. Feeling uneasy, the couple thought of ways to put an end to the two siblings' immoral feelings. Therefore, 
who sent the girl to study abroad after graduating from high school. Albeit reluctantly, ultimately, she was unable to defy her parents' orders. Moreover, for the sake of nipping their unethical feelings in the bud, her brother agreed to this arrangement and personally sent her off to the airport. Once he was back, Nathan Stark joined a media company and became the company's artistic director. Meanwhile, upon her return to the country, she also successfully entered the company. This scene was scheduled to be shot at Foxcom Tower. Previously, while they were in the middle of filming a scene, some paparazzi had dropped by to interview the production team of The Forbidden Love. James was not very happy about that. He did not like the media dropping by during taping without notice. He was hoping to build an air of suspense around this movie before its release, so he did not want the film's shooting process to be exposed to the public ahead of time. Hence, he ruthlessly chased away all those paparazzi. The reporters were disgruntled about this matter, but they could not do anything about it. Truth be told, they had an ulterior motive for visiting the movie set. With the pretense of a surprise visit to the set, they wanted to dig up any information about the real score between the two main leads, Martin and Monica. Monica was leaving her dressing room when she bumped into Martin, who happened to be passing by at the door. When the superstar saw her, he merely exchanged a perfunctory greeting with her before brushing past, cold, distant, and deliberately avoiding her. Ever since that scene in the music room, although the movie's production team had returned to how it was before, the two were no longer as close to each other as in the past. It could even be said that there was a large chasm existing between them now. Sometimes, during filming, not a word would be exchanged by the two to each other. She returned his smile and could not help feeling a slight disappointment in her heart. Still, she somewhat understood the reason for his change in attitude toward her. Nonetheless, her disappointment was not for something else, but rather for the loss of a dear friend. Whereas she thought of the superstar as a friend, the latter thought differently. He had affections for her, and they were the romantic kind. He was unsure of when he started to feel this way for her. Seeing her in a romantic light, he wanted to protect her and ensure that she would not come in harm's way. However, that day in the music room opened his eyes to the cruel reality that he did not have the capability to snatch her away from Stefan. If he were the head of the Lee family, he would perhaps have the chance to do so. Alas, now, be it in power or influence, he had nothing to compare with his rival for her heart. What was the point of fighting then? He would be unable to best that man for her hands in this lifetime. He was slightly embarrassed by this. What was more disappointing was that she only ever saw him as a friend. It was all just wishful thinking on his part. He had never been able to cause a ripple in her heart or make her waver in her decision. Her feelings for him were purely platonic. As such, he thought of a way to protect his heart from further heartbreak. If they were no longer as close as before, he would not fall any deeper. If he stopped falling deeper, he would stop getting hurt. Episode 344 Makeup Room Disputes Part 1 in the makeup room, Monica was sitting in front of the dressing mirror. Isabel, who was tidying the makeup kit at the side, smiled at her artiste's reflection in the mirror. Monica, I just realized that you have a face that suits any type of cosmetics applied to it. Gathering her wayward thoughts at the assistant's remark, she could not help but bestow a smile on her. Isabel, is your hand feeling any better? Her assistant nodded. Yes, my hand is fine now. The blisters have healed after using that ointment you've given me these few days. It's almost fully recovered by now. Don't push yourself. If it still hurts, you must tell me. The assistant replied. Oh, my Monica, 
I'm not that pitiful. It's nothing but a small injury. It is actually all better now. These words were what left her lips. But deep down, she was feeling grateful for her artiste's disconcern. Her artiste had given her a few days off. During that period that she was resting at home and away from her artiste's side, she was plagued with worry for Monica's well-being. She wondered if her artiste was being bullied or ostracized by the production team. Very concerned, she ended her emergency medical leave earlier than scheduled and rushed back on set. After listening to talks, she learned that Pamela had not been around these few days as well. She thus finally breathed a sigh of relief. The actress was probably not present on set due to her other commitments. Besides the forbidden love, the actress had accepted another movie project. Many established actors received a steady stream of film proposals. Therefore, most would choose to accept two or three projects at once and just arrange their schedules and shoots to accommodate all. James extremely loathed such style of working. Lacking the fundamental professionalism an actor should have, he very much wanted to drop Pamela. However, the backing she had was too strong, and her role in the film was given to her without any credentials. Helpless, he could only continue tolerating her. Since she had not been around these few days, most of her parts in the film had been arranged to be shot today. Actually, she was supposed to shoot for a few more scenes at the university, but they were all trashed by the director out of his peak. Logically speaking, she should be back to the production team today. Just thinking of working again with someone who lacked character already made Isabel feel down. Unfortunately, in this line of work, there was no other way. Even if one could not stand the sight of someone, they had to tolerate it. The makeup artist carefully put makeup on the face of Monica, who was sitting motionlessly in her chair with her eyes closed. Her makeup artist was still Malfoy. When Monica first joined the production team, its members did not put much regard to her. Regardless of the issue, first-tier actors always took precedence. The sequence for putting on makeup was Martin, Pamela, Claire, Edward. It was sequence based on an actor's celebrity tier. The various social standings of people, where those in the upper strata were held in high regard and venerated, and those in the lower strata were disregarded and looked down on, were perfectly demonstrated in the way this production team operated. There were several times when the production team was shorthanded, and Monica could not wait for her makeup artist to apply cosmetics on her face, so she had to do it herself. Thankfully, before joining the production team, she had a crash course in cosmetology, and this let her handle any urgent matters with no issues. Moreover, she was naturally in possession of fair skin. This was, therefore, not an unsolvable fix to her. Still, over time, her assistant began to have quite a few complaints, despite her not saying much about this treatment issue. She grumbled about this more than once. Monica, aren't they just bullying you because you have the lowest celebrity tier? It's fine if it's just a couple of times, but it's been more than that. They're really not taking you seriously. No matter what, you're still the female lead personally handpicked by director James here. I believe that you'll shoot to fame after this. They clearly have no foresight at all. She remained non-committal still. Her assistant grew more indignant at her silence. If it were me, I'd have Mr. Drake hire me a professional makeup artist for me. That way, I wouldn't have to tolerate others' meddling looks further. Our situation now is just so aggravating. She casually replied, if it's just for my convenience, then there's no need to trouble ourselves. Why not? Her assistant questioned. Every time that you urgently need to put on makeup, you're clearly the first to appear. But why is it that you're the last to receive assistance? I'm really furious on your behalf. She only explained, Isabel, if I engage a personal stylist, the others will think that, as a newbie, I'm acting like a big shot. 
and in that way, they will have more opinions about me. She did not want to stir up unnecessary trouble. Her assistant was stumped for words and could only abide by her will. I may not care about other people's opinions, but I'm afraid of trouble. So let's not stir up trouble. Besides, this is really no big deal. It had been quite some time since Monica joined the production team. With the exposure of her behind-the-scenes shots on the official Instagram fan page of The Forbidden Love, it garnered her a huge following. The number of her Instagram fans had broken through the 5 million mark now. While these 5 million fans might not be worth mentioning to some first-tier stars, and it was a normal occurrence for the new to replace the old in the entertainment industry, it was still rare for a newbie to receive much positive attention immediately after her debut. Such a feat could be said to be a surprise, as well as a confirmation of James's prior words. As long as she could seize an opportunity, Monica would definitely shoot to fame. Right now, she was a hot topic, and her popularity was on a steady climb. In the production crew, each member had a change in attitude toward her. No one dared to slight her anymore. At least in terms of details, she felt that she was slowly gaining the production team's recognition. Malfoy also paid attention to her now. Monica, you're truly a beauty, and have a face that is loved by the camera. The makeup stylist was currently applying eyeshadow on her. Looking at her client's reflection in the mirror, she could not help marveling at Monica's bewitching eyes. She burst into laughter at that. <laughs> That's because you have good skills. Oh, you flatter me. The makeup artist laughed. She kept the eyeshadow brush into her cosmetics kit, retrieved a box of lip gloss, and mixed the colors on a makeup palette before she said apologetically, Monica, your temper is really good. Applying makeup for you makes me feel the fascinating part of my job. From her first meeting with this artiste, she had already been sincerely fond of her. She thought that this newbie was humble, polite, and gentle. She had never once seen her make things difficult for any of the staff in the production team, and in fact, had always been very cooperative with others. She was acknowledged in this industry as a top-notch stylist. Hence, she was often in close association with first-tier stars, used to waiting on big-shot artists like Pamela and Christina. Working with this newbie was truly a breeze. Pamela belonged to the obstinate type of celebrity. She was opinionated and often ordered her stylist to give her the type of makeup she preferred. Take the previous makeup shot as an example. Logically speaking, her role was a charming and beautiful rebellious high school student, but the actress insisted on Malfoy giving her a pure makeup look. She even specified that she wanted her makeup to look the same as Monica's. She only wanted to compete with the latter. Naturally, Malfoy had reservations regarding her order as the pure makeup look was inappropriate for the actress's given role this time. She kindly advised her otherwise, but ended up being humiliated by the latter instead. She had no choice but to follow her will, and as a corollary, when the actress took the trial makeup shot, she was harshly scolded by the director. In order to shift the blame, the actress splashed a batson of dirty water on her and said that it was due to her lousy makeup skills. Episode 345, Makeup Room Dispute, Part 2 In the end, because of this, the director nearly kicked her out, and she almost lost her job as a makeup artist. How unjust she felt then. In this regard, Monica was different. Her features were truly exceptionally beautiful. Every makeup look she applied on her based on her character's personality the latter was able to pull off without a decrease in her beauty. Unparalleled. Moreover, 
She, unlike Pamela, had never rushed, harassed, or humiliated her. Not only was her temper good, she also had respect for others. This makeup artist was extremely thankful for that. When Monica had no fame to her name yet, no one in the production team treated her seriously. Even the extras paid no attention to her. Once she started getting popular, she remained humble and mild-tempered, nor did she start strutting around like a big shot. Just like before, she was punctual to the filming, she followed every arrangement of the staff, and she was calm and graceful. In fact, even when the extra previously offended her, she did not take it to heart. If it were Pamela, she would certainly remember to avenge a past grievance. She was a special person indeed. Gradually, everyone started genuinely liking her. As the three people happily chatted in this precious leisure time, they were suddenly interrupted by the sound of footsteps from outside. The forceful clacking of high heels against the marble floor preceded Pamela's arrival. The actress pushed open the door, then coldly stepped into the dressing room. Isabel looked in the direction of the door, and the smile on her face froze at the sight of her. Seeing the actress's return to the production team, the smile on the makeup artist's face gradually cooled off as well. Only Monica remained unperturbed and did not even spare the actress a glance. She continued to look at her reflection in the mirror as if the actress's arrival had got nothing to do with her. The actress scanned the crowd, her gaze finally landing on the trembling assistant. Ever since that incident, the assistant had developed a trauma toward the actress. She was afraid of this woman from the bottom of her heart. Hence, upon seeing her, she shrank into the corner. Eventually, Monica denied giving the actress a sidelong glance, but when she caught sight of her assistant's feeble and distraught appearance, as if she had seen a ghost, she could not help but smile helplessly. She was about to speak, but the actress's frigid voice beat her to the punch. Yo! What a coincidence! You guys are around too? The assistant bowed her head and reflexively hid at her artiste's side, not saying a word. She reached out and covered her assistant's hand, which was on her shoulder, reassuringly. Seeing the assistant quake in fear of her, Pamela's bright red lips parted as she laughed. <laughs> what a loyal dog! The relationship between the master and servant is quite close. Isabel remained mum as she shook in fear. The actress coldly asked, Hey, is your hand better? Malfoy, why did you stop? Monica turned a deaf ear to the actress's question. Seeing that the makeup artist had stopped moving at one side, she kindly prompted her. The makeup artist smiled and replied immediately. I got a little sidetracked thinking of what lip color I should match with your current makeup. What do you think of peach pink? Do as you deem fit. I trust your judgment. She smiled slightly. Her indifference was akin to perceiving the actress as nothing but air, virtually non-existent. A sullen expression crept into the actress's face. How capable this Monica was. Every word she spoke did not hurt her, whereas the latter could easily get a rise out of her. She harshly announced, Monica, get lost from here. This makeup room is now mine, and no part of it can be used by you. Isabel raised her head to defend her artiste, but Monica tightly held her hand to stop her. Her voice immediately halted. She clenched her teeth as she reigned in her anger. The three people strangely kept quiet, paying no further heed to Pamela's words in presence. Get out! The actress's voice grew sharper as she ordered them out again, but Monica made no move to follow her command. She angrily stumped toward her and swept the cosmetics on the table to the floor. Foundation, eyeshadow, every piece of cosmetics littered the floor at once. Malfoy raised her head in bewilderment. These were all her makeup items. She could tell that the actress hated Monica. But was there a need to implicate the innocent? 
Even though she was filled with discontent, she did not dare to speak out. She was facing Pamela, after all. Kinder back was Sylvester, the boss of Star Show Entertainment. Who would dare to offend such a huge supporter behind the scenes? Only Monica, this newbie, knew no fear. Monica looked up and cast a sidelong glance at her, her eyes seemingly deeming her actions as childish. What's the matter? I'm talking to you, but you're ignoring me. What's the meaning of this? Are you acting all high and mighty on me? The actress questioned her in a hysterical manner, her eyes cold and cruel, like a vicious cobra. Oh, I didn't hear you, she explained half-heartedly. The actress was beyond enraged. You clearly heard me. I didn't hear you speak human language. Monica's face remained unchanged. Her succinct, yet abundantly sarcastic statement utterly shocked Malfoy and Isabel at the back. Her speech might sound calm, but it revealed an inviolable disdain. How did she dare to speak to Pamela in this manner? Was she not afraid of offending her? Maybe this was a matter of youth not knowing fear, or did she not know this actress's background? Her assistant's heart pounded. Sure enough, the actress's face flushed in anger at the sarcastic remark. Despite the thick layer of foundation on her face, it still failed to hide her humiliation. She glared at her and lashed out. Monica, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that I don't speak human language? You explain it to me. Is it really hard to understand? No ivory comes out from a dog's mouth. Have you heard of this? Her lips curled into a mocking sneer. Sure enough, you're uncultured. You! The actress fumed. She restrained her impulse to give the other a tight slap. Revealing her white teeth, she sneered. Monica, I didn't expect you to have such a sharp tongue. I'm magnanimous at heart and won't argue with you. Now, I order you, get lost. Get lost? She innocently and curiously asked. Where do I go to, then? This makeup room is mine. Get out of here. An eyesore like you is forbidden from stepping in here. The actress warned her again. On what basis? She found this to be ridiculous. This Pamela's refinement must have been eaten by a dog. The actress insidiously enunciated, On the basis that I am Pamela Smith. I heard that you had come down with a fever for a few days. I see that you have recovered from it. But it seems that your brain got damaged by it in lieu. I believe you're misconstruing something. She smiled and finally turned to face her. This makeup room is not just for one person. Are you going to occupy it alone by force? The actress sneered. I don't care if it's for one person or for more. Regardless, this makeup room is now mine. Vacate it right this instant. No ivory comes out from a dog's mouth means no good words are to be expected from a scoundrel. Episode 346 Cannot Keep It Under Wraps For Much Longer Monica, you win. She pretended to be surprised. Surely not. Are you bullying the newbie now? I'm bullying you. What can you do about it? Pamela laughed. In her eyes, newbies, just like this one, besides having sharp tongues, were wholly vulnerable. Monica remained calm as she kindly reminded her. There are a lot of paparazzi outside today. If words of Pamela ostracizing a newcomer by claiming monopoly of a common makeup room got out, wouldn't the news tomorrow be very fascinating? Are you threatening me? The actress narrowed her eyes dangerously at her. Oh, no. Obviously, it's my senior, Pamela was making things difficult for this newbie here. She proceeded to point to the surveillance camera 
at one corner of the wall. This bullying is clearly caught on camera. The actress followed where she was pointing with her eyes, and indeed saw a small surveillance camera up there. She gritted her teeth as she wrung her head angrily to glare at her. Forcing herself to calm down, she said, Monica, you win. She smiled, albeit a tight-lipped one. In fact, her eyes were still frosty when she looked at the mirror again. Pamela, who felt that she had lost her stage presence before the two other women in the room, did not forget to threaten her before she left. Monica, I'm warning you. Don't be too arrogant. Don't think that just because Director Jane supports you, you can do whatever you want. Who do you think you are? Since you've offended me, don't expect for this to end well. The other, unfazed by her threat, reminded her in return. You talk too much. There's not much time left. Can't you just go put on your makeup? The two other women had long frozen on their spots. This Monica was really impressive. Could it be that she also had a powerful background? And that was why she was unafraid of Pamela's threat at all? Seeing her annoyed expression, the actress was about to flare up again. At the door, Martin's magnetic voice came. Pamela. Tensing, the actress promptly hit her vicious look as she turned around, putting on a sweet smile with the demeanor of a goddess again, and seeing the superstar standing there, she readily welcomed him. Martin, it's you! The startled Monica turned to look at him too. Alas, she only saw the man standing at the entrance, looking at the actress with his cold eyes, and never casting a glance her way. Facing the actress, he asked, You're back. Are you feeling better these days? She shyly smiled, feeling touched. Martin, oh, thank you for your concern. After resting for a few days, the fever has gone down, and I'm feeling much better now. Isabel was left speechless. This Pamela was said to be an empty vase. She had the look, but not the talent. However, right now, her acting skills were superb. She clearly had a fierce expression just moments ago. With a turn, she changed her look. How disgusting. After exchanging pleasantries, the man then said, Well, take care of your body. The next few scenes are very important. The actress smiled and nodded coyly. Yes, Martin. Take care of your body, too. Is your workload still the same lately? He answered vaguely. I should go back now to prepare for my lines. Filming will start soon. Okay. Keep it up. With that, he left the makeup room. Earlier when he passed by, he overheard an argument erupting inside, followed by Monica's voice. He worriedly stepped in to take a gander. Sure enough, he saw Pamela harassing her. Helping to defuse the situation... He naturally could not let Monica realize his concern for her. Once she sent off the man from the door, the actress quickly turned to sit in front of the mirror. Malfoy, come over and apply my makeup first. Malfoy, who was presently painting Monica's lips, froze when she heard this. Malfoy, haven't I said to come over here and apply my makeup first? Did you hear me or what? Malfoy! Pamela turned her head and snapped at her. The makeup artist quickly tried to plead with her. Sister Pamela, can you wait for a moment? I'll complete Monica's makeup right away, and then... Monica? <laughs> How affectionate! The actress snorted. In your heart, is she more important than me? The makeup artist shut her mouth at once, her hands starting to tremble. Isabel finally spoke up. Monica's makeup is almost done. Sister Pamela, can you wait a little while longer? You want me to wait for her? How are you qualified to talk to me, you shameless bitch? She bellowed. At this point, the assistant no longer dared to argue with her. 
Monica pursed her lips. She now understood a little why the other people in this production team were ostracizing her. It was not that they wanted to shun her. Instead, someone was forcing them to do so. Malfoy was a top-notch stylist in the industry, but even so, she still did not dare to go against her, just like Monica had just done. In this line of work, one dared not to offend people arbitrarily, especially someone like Pamela, who had a ferocious character. She knew that if she ran over to help the actress with her makeup, Monica would not mind about this. She had always been magnanimous, and would not be so particular about this kind of thing. However, she did not wish to do that. This artiste had always treated her well. If she did that, she would surely feel disloyal. As she was hesitating, the other took the lipstick from her hand and faintly said with a reassuring smile, Go over. I can do this one on my own. You've done most of the job, so the rest shouldn't be a problem. Her makeup would be completed after applying the lipstick and contouring the outline of her face. There was no need to make things difficult for her. But, go on, it's nothing. Don't worry about it. With that, she outlined her lips while looking at the mirror. The makeup artist, gratefully, yet guiltily, turned to go to the actress's side to apply makeup on the latter. Do my makeup nicely. Don't make it like last time. At least, it must be nicer than Monica's. The threat in the actress's words made her break out in a cold sweat. The actress cast a glance at the newbie again, before she added, If my makeup isn't better than hers, then you can say goodbye to your job here. Despite her anger, the makeup artist kept her silence. She thought, you're just supporting character, while Monica is the protagonist. How can a minor character steal the limelight from the protagonist? She only dared to think of these words in her head, though. Monica continued to view the actress as MTL. Once her makeup was done, she took her script and left the room to reimpose her acting. While the makeup artist was styling her hair, the actress took out a copy of the script, too, and flipped through it. The next scene had her and Monica acting together. She skimmed through the script, and her lips suddenly lifted into a sinister smile. The Lewis Residence Gracia plopped on the couch and languidly. With her phone in hand, she expressionlessly scrolled through Instagram. A servant waited on her from the side. Peeling the skin of a grape, she delivered the flesh into her mistress's mouth. Her mistress opened her mouth, sucked on it, and finally crushed it inside her mouth. For the past few days, she did not step out of the house. Peter Lewis had insisted on her focusing on taking care of her stomach. She did not know the outcome of the matter she had arranged for Mark to do. Lowering her head, she reached out to caress her still flat stomach. She knew in her heart that such a poor lie could not be kept under wraps for much longer. Episode 347, Acting Out the Appearance of a Slap Mystery Mail Pamela had to come up with a countermeasure fast before her lie got exposed. Otherwise, it would be very hard to defend herself. The crux of the matter was that she did not know at all what evidence Stefan had in his hands. She was guessing that the man had already checked her identity fully. It was unknown how far he had investigated. This was the most worrying part. Also, she could not guess his way of thinking and routine at all. Scrolling through Instagram, she found out that Monica's behind-the-scenes photos were almost everywhere. Be it a photo of her smiling with a lunchbox in hand, a picture of her back as she stood ramrod straight at the backstage, or a candid shot of her beautiful side profile while she played with her silky hair. Even when she was coincidentally looking back while smiling, that shockingly refined face of hers attracted a mass of comments. Beautiful. Simply too beautiful. The behind-the-scenes photos attracted many fans who judged by looks. 
The movie had yet to be released, but the movie's attractiveness value to the public was over the top. This was especially the case for Monica's popularity, which was steadily on the rise. Her momentum was so overwhelming, it even covered the enthusiasm for Martin to become the most trending topic on Instagram. Gracia was so livid, she tightened her grip on her phone. Suddenly, a notification popped up from it. Her mailbox had received a new message. She curiously clicked to open this mail. Reading its content, her face paled in an instant. She shot up straight and stared at the attached photos in the mail. A few scans of documents were before her eyes. Flipping through each page, the more files she saw, the more palpable her fear became. What was this? A new mail popped up again. She was slightly startled. With her fingers trembling, she clicked open the new mail. It only contained a succinct message. Want to get the information back? I'll wait for you at Avenue Commune's private room 505 at 1 p.m. today. Avenue Commune was a famous private clubhouse in the capital. Most of the rich frequented it. There was no information about the sender at all. No name, address, or contact information could be traced. The attachment in this mail terrified her nonetheless. How could it be? Who had gotten hold of these documents? All this evidence was fatal to her. Her face paled. Seeing this, the servant at the side asked her in concern. She blew up and slapped each cheek of the person. Scram! Get away! All of you! Don't bother me! The servants retreated, afraid of getting implicated in her rage. She stood up in frustration and walked back and forth for a few steps. Should she go? What was the sender's identity? How could it be? Just exactly how did the person get hold of this incriminating evidence on her? Was the person an ally or foe? Would it be too risky if she hastily went? Sam's knowledge of this person's identity, she was a little afraid to go. Moreover, Peter Lewis had forbidden her from going out. The old man said that the first trimester was unstable, and he wanted her to recuperate at home. He even pushed the company's work on to the others. Just as she could not make up her mind, she received another mail on her phone. Opening it, that person left a line. If you don't show up, then don't blame me for being unscrupulous. <laughs> she gritted her teeth. Just who is this person to go as far as to threaten me? It seemed that she had no choice but to go. She gripped her phone and narrowed her eyes. She intended to use this chance to meet this ill-intentioned, mysterious person. She decided to go. Everything at the filming scene was carried out in an orderly manner. Monica and Pamela's scene was set at the basement. Alas, at this moment, it was deadly silent on set. Everyone looked with dumbfounded eyes at the two women surrounded by the camera crew. Smack! A loud slap echoed about. Pamela swung her hand heavily into Monica's cheek. With almost her entire being's strength, together with her imposing manner, a crisp sound resonated from the collision of the palm and the cheek nearly to the whole set. Everyone watched, open-mouthed, what was happening. Caught off guard, Monica was wide-eyed in shock from this merciless slap, unable to regain her senses fully. The air was nearly stifling in its stillness. On the sidelines, Isabel was so badly shocked, her mouth hung agape. The actress withdrew her hands and stared at the newbie viciously, crying out hysterically, Diana Spark, why did you return? Won't you let me off? Or won't you let your brother off? Her mournful and despairing voice pervaded the still basement. It was impactfully mind-blowing. The actress at this moment was indubitably into her role. Monica looked at her in shock, taking a long while to regain her senses. She narrowed her eyes at her. She had apparently underestimated this woman's viciousness. Vicious. This actress was utterly vicious. Her silence stretched for a minute, and her lines stayed unuttered. 
James's gaze left the monitor to fall on Pamela with cold suspicion. Put! He stood up and inquired, Monica, are you in the wrong state or have you forgotten your lines? Why didn't you read aloud your lines? She pursed her lips and smiled stiffly. My apologies, Director James. I was distracted for a bit. He got angry and frustrated, having expected better from her. Distracted? You got distracted during filming? You'd better be more professional. It's work right now, understand? Stay focused. Understood. Her assistant was wide-eyed at this, finding it unbelievable. What was wrong with him? He was a big director. Did he not see it? The actress had just deliberately humiliated her artiste. This section of the plot was about Diana Stark's return to the country and entrance at the same company as her brother. Unfortunately, at the basement, she bumped into Pamela's character, Catherine Holmes, her brother's fiancé. She was a childhood friend of the siblings whom she grew up with. Coming from a wealthy family, which had close ties with the Starks, and having feelings for Nathan Stark, she naturally eventually became the man's fiancé. Be it her rebellious phase or her adulthood, she had always been devoted to him. Regrettably, the man had always been deeply in love with his sister. Even though his sister was abroad, he still could not give up his feelings for her. Catherine Holmes knew very well that she did not have a place in the man's heart. Just as the two were about to be engaged, the man's sister returned to the country. When the two coincidentally met each other, this man's fiancé lost her cool and questioned her motive for returning to the country. In general, in movies, plots which involved slapping, all made use of angle and positioning, montage techniques where one hand mimicked slapping and another held one's face sans reservation, acting out the appearance of a slap. Episode 348, A Play of Slaps, Part 1 By manipulating the camera angles and imitating fingerprint marks on the face with cosmetics, the execution of a visceral slap was then considered a success. It was just that ensuring propriety was a tricky business. At first, when Pamela pretended to slap her, although unknown whether intentional or unintentional, Monica was still very cooperative. Yet, this slapping scene seemed to be very sudden. Either Pamela's hand was faster by a beat, or Monica's movement was slower by a beat. But their tempo was just off, and it resulted into that accidental slap. The film director was so furious that he stomped his feet and harshly scolded Pamela. She protested indignantly. You can't blame me here! Not only do I have to spout such long lines... I also need to control my emotions and pay attention to my positioning. On top of that, I must ensure that I don't really hit her for real. It's just too tall a task. How do you expect me to cope with all that? He frowned and clenched his teeth in anger. Why don't you try letting me slap her for real? Maybe that will give a more realistic effect. Director James, with how dedicated you are to your work, you can surely understand my difficulties, right? I truly want this filming to go smoothly and prove my acting skills. Besides, I've played such scenes before. Getting slapped once or twice is nothing. Monica, as an earnest newbie, should agree with me. The actress suggested all that, and then looked at Monica, who was standing near her. Do you agree? She pursed her lips and looked at the director silently. If this were suggested by other actors, she would readily agree. But this was Pamela speaking, so how could she not have qualms? Indubitably, this was the actress venting her anger on her by making use of the plot. The director frowned. In fact, many actors who grew anxious after accumulating a few bad takes would suggest doing it for real. Even top-tier and veteran actors would do it for real, for the sake of passing the scene smoothly in one take, or making it appear more realistic. While they inevitably suffered from a little pain, 
their effort would often not pay off. Would Monica agree, though? He did not know of the existing bad blood between the two women, and only knew that Pamela's performance had improved a lot in the course of this movie's filming. If he could get a good result from this, then he was all for it. But the final say in this was still on Monica. Since the director himself asked, she could of course only nod. Hence, there was that earlier scene. The actress's flap was too hard. Her face quickly turned red, highlighting the stinging handprint on her aflame cheek. Her assistant ran over with heartache, her fingertips touching her stinging cheek. The actress had figuratively pierced a hole through her heart. Monica, does it hurt? The assistant carefully asked, her voice stuck in her throat. She hissed and coldly replied, It doesn't hurt. How could it not hurt? The other actress had used her full force on that slap in hopes of drawing blood. More than pain, she felt overwhelming humiliation deep down. The actress did it on purpose. There was no doubt about it. It was past her expectation for the other to take revenge on her through such a despicable method. It's too much. How could she do this? Her assistant nearly cried from the heartache. Go talk to director James to shoot this scene using a forced perspective. If we continue like this, we don't know how many more times she's going to do it. Your youth? She expressionlessly asked. It's useless. Even if she gave feedback to the director, could this scene be skipped? How is that possible? Generally, in movies, slapping scenes created hype. How could it, therefore, be skipped? She finally had a first-hand experience of the unscrupulous level Pamela was willing to stoop to. Tears rolled down Isabel's cheeks as her heart ached. She felt guilty for having implicated her artiste. If it were not for a small assistant like her, her artiste would not have an existing enmity with this vile actress. Malfoy rushed forward as well to cover the reddish handprint with a concealer. Just looking at it made her feel pain inside. Martin looked from the sidelines, just like stagnant water. His face was a mask of coldness and desolation. He had the desire to step forward, but at the last second, he stayed put. His eyes were dark, and his fists were tightly clenched. The director stomped his feet in anger and gave Monica another warning. You'd better not get distracted again. Try to get this in one take, okay? She nodded. She knew that he was worried for her, fearful that she would not get it in one take and would have to be slapped again. The actors returned to their places. Catherine, it's been a while since we've last met. Standing on her original spot, Monica smiled slightly with her clear eyes. Her pure look seemed to suggest that she was doing well. Diana Stark! Why did you return? Into her role as Catherine Holmes, Pamela looked at her incredulously. She stepped forward and almost mournfully asked, What are you doing back here? Can't I be back? She looked at her with wide eyes, confused by the other woman's hostility. This is my home. If I don't return... Where can I go? Snuck! The slap landed on the same place as before. Yet the force behind it was even bigger than earlier. Pamela appeared to be channeling all her rage into it. She hated it. She completely abhorred this proud and unyielding newbie. Recalling her earlier humiliation, she wanted to tear off this newbie's nonchalant face. Hence, since the need to brew her emotions, she vividly and thoroughly displayed her anger. The force of this slap made Monica a little unstable on her feet. Her body swayed as one side of her ear rang. She suffered from tinnitus for a moment. With great difficulty, she eventually managed to stand firm on her feet. She cradled her face and then looked up to the actress, who was staring straight at her, but did not read out her lines for a long time. After a long lag, she turned to grimace at James in sheer embarrassment. James, I forgot my lines. Silence reigned on the set. Martin, in particular, could nearly not keep it to himself. Anger surged on his handsome face, and cold breaths constantly streamed out from him. 
Everyone had clearly witnessed it this time. It was obvious that Pamela had done it on purpose. Suppressing the newbie through the scene, she was clearly instilling a lesson to her. Claire, at the side, was part of the next scene. But since the scene's bad takes kept piling up, with no signs of it succeeding, hers continued to be delayed as well. Her makeup was constantly retouched. She could also tell that the actress had malicious intentions. This was her usual way of teaching newbies a lesson. She had experienced it before, too. Sitting in front of the monitor, the director looked at Monica through the lens. She was motionless. She stood in one place, with indifferent eyes. Her face was pale, with one side of her cheeks red and dripping with blood. The handprint was once again apparent. The burning pain only reminded her of how fierce the actress had been in her slop. Episode 349, A Play of Slaps, Part 2 At the sides, countless mockeries, slurs, and vicious censures of Pamela's supporters pierced her like poisonous daggers. However, as if she had not heard them, just like an ethereal fairy, her face remained cool, proud, and elegant. The actress clenched her teeth as she stabbed her with eyes full of vexation. She stood there, all quiet, unmoved by this humiliation. Pamela originally thought that these two slaps would make this newbie shamelessly grovel before her for mercy. If it were others, even if they managed not to beg for mercy, they would still grievously wail for her to be light-handed. This one did not, though. She only stood there, stock still, her body as buoyant as a fluttering butterfly. This made her snort. What she had was time. She would see just how long this newbie could persist. Smack! Monica's face was slapped to one side. There was another buzzing sound. She even had a suspicion that her eardrum was perforated by this. The actress's supplementary laughter faintly floated to her ears. Director James, I wasn't in the right state just then. We didn't match the script. Annoyed, James yelled, Pamela! This is the set, and not your playground. While he was ignorant to the enmity between these two women, just from these few bad takes, even a blind man could tell that Pamela was doing it on purpose. Hence, there was a displeased rebuke in his tone. This actress, however, did not care. What of this newbie being under his protection? Did she have any capability to terminate her? She was not afraid at all. The superstar went up to her side, and with hidden anger, said, Pamela, you've had enough. Martin, I don't understand what you're talking about. What do you mean? She feigned ignorance, while she felt all the more disgruntled inside. You clearly did it on purpose. Her voice turned cold as his gaze turned razor sharp. If you continue to do this, trust me, I'll ban me. Pamela finished his words for him with bitter eyes. You treat me like this just for a newbie? Martin, to think that we've been partners for so many years. For the sake of my face, stop what you're doing to her. All right. I really didn't do it on purpose. It's really unintentional, she insisted. Even though he did not believe her, there was nothing he could do. He knew that if Monica bowed down to this vile actress, she'd probably suffer less. But he believed that she would never do that with how stubborn she was. Smack! Monica's face twisted to one side again. Her body was as stiff as a rock, and her face was as white as a blank sheet of paper. Todd! The actress took a glimpse at her. Oh dear, what's the matter with me? Oh, why am I so out of it today? Just from looking at your face? Monica, you're really infuriating. The other merely smiled calmly at her, and just like a doll without feelings, she turned her face to look at her with marble clear eyes. Sister Pamela, your foundation is beyond lousy. You, Monica, you're really stubborn. The actress viciously threatened. Smack. Monica, your earlier look is off. 
but it's okay, as it doesn't matter. Being a newbie, making mistakes sometimes is fine. Just pay attention to it next time. Monica closed her eyes, seemingly adjusting her mood. When she opened them again, her gaze was like the infinite sky, light and boundless. I'm also feeling disturbed that, despite having so many bad takes, you still can't seem to remember your lines. Monica. She glared viciously at her first, before she broke into an evil grin. All right, bitch. We'll see. Smack. James, this newbie's glare at me gave me a shock. Do you think he's being marked by her now? Touch. She could no longer keep track of the many bad takes and slaps she received from this woman. Her body swayed slightly as her peripheral limbs turned cold and clammy. It had become difficult for her to lift her head by now. Adding the thoughtless remarks of those around her, the humiliation and shame she was receiving nearly oppressed her to the point of suffocation. This feeling seemed to wrap around her throat and choke her alive. She had never been this humiliated before. Her pride, like her face, was shredded into pieces, stomped under this woman's feet. It was mind-numbing and shameful. She held back her tears forcefully as her frosty eyes ran red. Let's take a break now. Everyone, take this chance to get yourself into the right frame of mind. Isabel helped her artiste into the restroom. The former burst into tears when she saw the latter's overtly red and swollen cheeks. Oh, it's too much. She's too much. Malfoy was equally flustered from anger as she tried to conceal the bruises on Monica's face with thick foundation. Alas, swelling and wound could not be hidden by the many layers she applied on the artiste's face. Monica sipped her lips and contemplated this most shameful moment in her life. A black Bentley halted at the basement parking lot of Foxcom Tower. Harry walked to the car and opened the rear door for his boss to alight gracefully. An important board meeting here required his attendance. This parking floor was usually empty and quiet. However, this time around, Stefan could see some human traffic. They seemed to be part of a production crew, judging from their attire. He promptly ordered his secretary to check this out in greater detail. His assistant walked toward a busy cluster and returned with the updates not too long after. Boss, there's a filming underway right now. Filming? He frowned. Which production team? The Foxcom has invested some time ago, The Forbidden Love. It's directed by James. James Scott? That's the movie Monica's acting, right? He clenched his lips for a moment. Although he was not abreast with the entertainment news, he was still aware that his woman's debut would be in The Forbidden Love, which was currently being directed by James. Does that mean she's around too? Let's go have a look. Harry reminded, hesitatingly, Boss, the board meeting is about to commence. It won't take long. I just want to have a quick look. Okay. His assistant nodded, then followed behind him quietly. When the man reached the production set, the crew's filming was already underway. He looked at the center of activity and saw Monica and Pamela facing off each other. From his angle, he could only partially catch sight of his woman's face. She looked light and dewy with lifeless and hollow eyes. Indeed, she looked as if she were barely breathing. It was as if her life force had been sucked out from her, leaving behind a hollow shell. His heart twitched painfully at the sight. Pamela was staring down at her. From the gestures and mannerisms, she seemed to be interrogating the latter as her mouth moved. However, he was too far to catch her words clearly. Harry, who was standing beside him, commented, But what are they acting about? Miss Thames' is acting seems to be spot on. He reckoned that her strange look was part of her script. Episode 350, Eardrum Perforation, Part 1 Martin's thin lips curled slightly. Knowing that this was acting did not stop his heart from aching. 
Let's go. Just as he turned his back on this, two crisp and loud slaps reached his ears. Smack! Smack! He froze in his tracks. His shoulders pulled taut and cold as he swiveled around just in time to catch sight of the actress slapping his woman. Her body swayed with that slap across her cheek. Harry gave a slight gasp as he witnessed the scene as well. Monica vividly felt her ear break from the impact of the lightning assault. Accompanying that was a sharp sting at her one eye and in her eardrum, and in the next moment, all sounds around her were lost. She could not hear anything after that. Pamela was unaware of her unusually pale face. As such, with a stomp of her feet, she turned to shout, James! What should I do? The director's temper had reached its tipping point by then. He hollered impatiently in return. Damn it! What happened to you again? Get lost if you can't get it right this time. You're not going to act anymore after this. The woman acted piteously and innocently. You look at Monica. She's so distracted that I can't get my lines right. She's obviously being uncooperative. Isabel watched in horror at the side, fearful that her charge would collapse at any moment. In retrospect, she was hoping for that to happen. That would spare her artiste from further harm, after all. As Pamela was blaming her charge outright for not cooperating. But who could withstand such harsh harassment in the first place? The director reined his anger and turned to Monica, only to be shocked by what he saw. Everyone looked in the direction of the leading lady. She was struggling to keep herself standing as she laboriously lifted her head and pried open her swollen eye. A horrifying pool of blood had accumulated at the corner of her left eye. Everything seemed shaking and falling apart around her. Her body swerved one more time. She did not look well, obviously. Instead, she looked like she would faint any time soon. She stood up abruptly from behind the monitor. Her co-actress saw blood coagulating at the side of her eye and laughed coyly. Oh, dear. Monica, was I too harsh? I'm so sorry, but you can't really blame me here. Without warning, she stared down at the poor girl and whispered viciously, Your face irritates me. That's why. In her last thread of consciousness, she caught her merciless and mocking snippet. Her body shook, and finally, feet could no longer bear her weight. Her taut and tense nerves snapped, and her body toppled backward. Monica! Monica! All of a sudden, most of the people present surged forward while calling her name. Martin could bear it no longer. The moment he saw her fall, he moved to rush to her. However, before he could take a few more steps forward, a terrifying force pushed him aside. Martin staggered for a few steps. Alas, before he could do anything... A tall figure emanating hostility swiftly walked past him to reach Monica's side first. Stefan, why was he here? In that very moment, everyone at the venue was shell-shocked. Even Pamela's face turned ghastly pale as she stood rooted to the spot. She did not expect Monica to be so frail, fainting from just a few slaps. What she had failed to consider, though, was how heavy-handed she had been. Would any normal person be able to take it? The members of the production team surrounded the unconscious artiste. Her assistant, who now knelt helplessly beside her, broke into tears as she regarded her inflamed and swollen cheek. Shakily, she fished out her phone and called for an ambulance. Stefan was enraged. Viciously pushing the crowd to the side, he crouched slightly to embrace his woman. He gently caressed her cheek which had just been slapped, and felt that it was hot to the touch. This would not have been possible if it had just been a mere slap on the face. He held her shoulders lovingly, anguish and rage coursing through him. He had to take in a deep, calming breath first, before he could rein in his uncontrollable urge to wreck this set. Slowly lifting his head, he glared at the person who had reduced his woman into this sorry state. 
How dared she slap her for real? She did it in such a heavy-handed way, too. Was she courting death? Pamela could feel his murderous eyes on her person. Right now, his icy aura was much like a panther, eyeing its prey for the killing. It was as if, any second now, he would lunge at her and swallow her whole without leaving a piece behind. Getting the feeling that a dreadful monster was eyeing her, she broke out in a cold sweat as she took a few involuntary steps backward. When this aristocratic man, with his godly features, first rushed on set, many failed to recognize him. After all, based on their social standing, they had the privilege to meet Makewell Financial Group's CEO personally. Likewise, the actress also failed to identify him at first, but after sizing up his bearing, she belatedly realized that he was the Lewis Group's crown prince. What was his relationship with this newbie? Witnessing him embrace her with a distraught face, she was at a loss on what to think. A prior reminder from someone abruptly popped in her mind. That newbie, she has a bit of background. Sister Pamela, you'd better not offend her. A bit of background? Could this bit of background that person had spoken of referring to? She carefully mulled it over and practically broke out in a cold sweat. The hand that had just slapped Monica was still numb. At this moment, as she considered the possibility of this newcomer being this man's woman, her hair could not help but stand on end. All she wanted was to teach this newcomer, who did not know any better, a lesson. After all, she had just debuted recently, yet she was already carrying herself with such arrogance. Low was her status compared to her. Not only did she treat her casually, she also mingled with her seniors rather conceitedly time and again. She just wanted to coach this newcomer of this industry's rules. Little did she know that she was this man's woman. With a lifeless complexion, this actress stood rooted to the spot. The man lifted his head while keeping his woman secured in his arms. Her body was weak and petite, weighing no more than a feather. He was able to embrace her fully with just one arm and just an ounce of strength. He approached Pamela. His gaze was so sharp it seemed capable of cutting her. In a split second, the actress felt as if her body had been punctured a thousand times. You. Were you the one who had hit her? His icy thin lips parted to produce these cold words. The murderous glint in his eyes could no longer be restrained and was on the verge of erupting. She kept her head low, fearful of meeting his eyes as she reigned in a shiver. She refused to admit her deed, but she feared denying it even more. There were many pairs of eyes on set that had seen her in action, and with a few of them being close to this newbie, if she were to try denying it, someone was bound to step forward and point a finger to her. Still, even if she was given more courage, she would certainly not dare admit it to. She was afraid of him squashing her thoroughly if she did. By no means was this an exaggeration. This man certainly had the ability to do so. Stefan. His name brought fear to many. If only she had known earlier that the person backing this newcomer was him. No matter what, she would not have willingly sought to trouble her. Isabel, who was standing next to them, shook with anger. Even though she did not know the identity of the man hugging her charge, she could tell that this vile actress held him in high regard. One could even say that she was terrified of him. He had to be someone with a lofty status. Knowing this, she was no longer daunted by the actress's background. With tears in her eyes, she pointed a finger to her. She's the culprit! The one who hit Monica! She was deliberately making things hard for my artiste! Monica's doing quite fine, but she just had to seek trouble with her by requesting a real slapping scene! She used this excuse to slap my artiste a few times! <laughs> Monica is so pitiful! This woman was clearly exacting vengeance on her through this. We all saw it. Pamela did it on purpose. Even though it's just acting, 
and forced perspective could technically be used, she still wanted to slap her for real. Yes, yes, yes! One slap wasn't enough for her, too. She even pretended to forget her lines. Ultimately, she slapped Monica more times than one could count. Yeah, she's been targeting Monica from day one. We all know it. But in any case, Monica's very humble and treats everyone with kindness. We all really like her. Pamela truly went overboard this time. She kept making mistakes on purpose. And as time went by, her slaps only got more heavy-handed. Let's send Monica to the hospital quickly to have a look. I'm worried about her. That's right. Send her to the hospital quickly. Pamela was really cruel to her. Hope that nothing untoward happens to Monica. Otherwise, we will never forgive this actress. The angry outbursts of the crowd piled up. The finger pointing of the production crew was relentless. Many workers mustered up their courage and voiced out their perspective. Episode 351, Eardrum Perforation, Part 2 Monica's attitude on set and in public was consistently great. She was neither obsequious nor supercilious with the production team and celebrity assistants alike. As a corollary, at this crucial moment, many people willingly risked offending Pamela by bravely identifying her as the culprit. In the depths of her heart, the actress was enraged and annoyed. She raised her head to scan the crowd with a sinister glint in her eyes. Everyone was cowed by her furious stare. Those voices filled with indignation began to die down. Despite deeply empathizing with Monica for the injustice done to her, no one truly dared to step forward and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the actress. Pamela defended herself loudly. I did not. I didn't do it on purpose. My condition today just isn't at its best causing a few bad takes, but it's definitely not on purpose. She looked at Stefan with a pleading gaze. Mr. Lewis, please believe me. You did it on purpose. A discordant yet elegant voice of a woman sounded from the back. It was Claire who had spoken. Unfazed by her threatening gaze, she testified. I saw it. She did it on purpose. What did you say? Sister Pamela. We're all actors. A mistake like this could have been avoided easily. Even if a real slap were needed, don't you think that the strength you've used is too much? There's no need for you to explain anything. The bad takes from the scene have all been recorded. Wouldn't things be made clear once we look at them? She was neither overbearing nor servile when she spoke, and this caused the actress's complexion to drop. You! I saw it too! I saw it too. I... I saw it as well. Seeing that Claire was standing up against her, the rest of the actors picked up their courage, stood up, regardless of everything, and accused Pamela righteously. The actress was terrified. She stumbled backward shakily and shook her head furiously. It's not... it's really not... I, I truly did not do it on purpose. You guys are obviously working together to frame me. Claire stood at where she was. On the outside, she was calm and collected. Yet on the inside, her heart was beating erratically. Indubitably, she had never gone against the actress's authority before. In the production team, Pamela received preferential treatment. This was not her first time collaborating with the actress. In their work together, she was always forced to give in to her tyranny. Suddenly, someone next to her asked softly, Claire, I thought that you disliked Monica. Why did you help her today? I didn't help her, she answered flatly. It's me I was helping. The person failed to comprehend what she meant, but did not probe further. Unexpectedly, she volunteered an explanation. Although I did say that I dislike her, I never said that I hate her. We all saw how overbearing Kamala had been earlier. Don't tell me that at a time like this, we should just remain silent. Indeed, she did not like the newbie. 
She was unlike Pamela. The latter only reached her present position through the push from the back of her powerful helper. She was forced to learn how to scheme, fight openly, and maneuver covertly. Slowly, her personality was polished into one that was tactful and sly when dealing with social relations. As for Monica, what she had was her unchanging genuineness from the very start. Even though Claire disliked Monica, it was not to the extent of hate. Interacting with her for so long, she saw that the latter was humble and bore no malice for others. Once she had almost passed out from the sweltering heat, Monica fortunately noticed Claire's strange demeanor and sent her to the emergency medical room in time. On the way over, due to heat stroke, she vomited and dirtied her clothes, yet not a shred of disgust was seen on the latter's face. That day was probably what had changed her perspective of the newbie. Alas, due Pamela, she was unable to express how close she felt toward her. She flattered the powerful and bullied the weak. The way she hyped herself by hook or by crook was extremely revolting. However, she was afraid to go against the actress. At least in terms of background, she was no match for her. Thus, when she saw the murderous glare Stefan had cast Pamela's way earlier, she suddenly understood it. In that immensely powerful man's heart, Monica occupied a sizable proportion. Was she his woman? From her years in this industry, she had encountered him a few times. This was truly the first time she had seen him show more than just a cold and apathetic look on his face. She even thought prior to this that nothing in this world held sway over him. Monica was able to affect him unexpectedly. She thus took advantage of the rookie's importance in the man's heart to eradicate Pamela, the thorn in her flesh, once and for all. She was sure that he would never let the actress off, especially since she had hurt his woman this much. In the Lewis Group's private hospital, the atmosphere in the doctor's office was grave and as tense as a taut bow. The unconscious Monica was on the treatment bed. She appeared not to even be breathing. The nurses standing next to her bed cautiously gazed at the emotionless man sitting in a chair. The doctor flipped through the examination report calmly, yet the trembling of his hands betrayed his real emotion. Stefan glared at him apathetically, his cold lips pressed into a thin line. Although he was just sitting silently, the aura around him was still intimidating. When a nurse made a slight sound as she walked into the room with the prescription, he gave a stern command while looking fierce. Be quiet. The chilling stare was as sharp as an unsheathed blade, daunting enough to make everyone present sour in fear. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, young master. It's not on purpose. The nurse frantically apologized. Didn't I say to be quiet? Shut up! He merely replied with an icy look. Yes. The nurse bit her lower lip instantly, afraid of making another sound. As he returned his cold gaze onto the doctor, the latter could not help but shiver. The frightening aura this man was giving off really made it hard for one to stay calm. How is she? Are her injuries severe? The man's voice was laced with worry. The doctor lifted his head and cleared his throat. It can be said to be severe, but not that severe. I don't want such an ambiguous answer. His eyes reflected a tinge of unhappiness. The doctor responded instantly. The swelling in Miss Thames' face will go down after some time. As for her left eye, it just has a subconjunctival hemorrhage and is not something worrisome. We've already treated it with a cold compress, so it should be gone in a couple of days. Episode 352 Mysterious Person The doctor paused and then added, The only cause for worry here is that according to the examination, her eardrum has perforated. This is rather serious. Serious? How serious? He widened his eyes. What do you mean by this perforated eardrum? The doctor explained at once. 
Miss Thames's eardrum received trauma due to the repeated application of external force. Her tympanic membrane has a tear, and it's slightly hemorrhaging. But since this part of the human anatomy has strong regenerative ability, with proper care it should heal in slightly over half a month. It needs over half a month to heal? The man frowned. Hearing his sullen tone and seeing his scary expression, the doctor broke into a cold sweat. He clenched his fists. She is badly hurt. That Pamela had struck her so hard, her eardrum ruptured. Damn. He looked up and said in a cold voice, Will it have any impact on her hearing in the future? The doctor answered, With proper care, it shouldn't have. I don't want such vague answers. He frowned and drummed his fingertips heavily on the table, coldly declaring, Listen carefully. I don't care for that bleeding membrane, perforated eardrum, or whatnots. I just want her to be undamaged. If she has a sequelae from this... Stefan's voice sank, and his eyes turned frosty as he trailed off. Yet the meaning of his remaining words was self-evident. The doctor shuddered in fright at his frosty look. Immediately smiling apologetically, he promised to do his best. If Miss Thames had any mishaps, he would probably lose his job as well. The man walked to the bed and reached out to caress his woman's serene face. His anger remained unstopped upon seeing her swollen cheek. Heartbroken. He was extremely heartbroken. At the same time, he was secretly furious at how stupid this woman could get. Why did she let herself be humiliated by others? One slap after another? Was she not in pain? If someone hit her, did she not know how to retaliate? In front of him, she always had a sharp tongue. She would bare her teeth and draw her claws like a cat when she was provoked. Why, then, would she only suffer in silence in front of others? He believed that no one would dare do anything to her if she retaliated. If it were not for her injury now, he would really lose it, bite her lips fiercely to let her feel pain and wake up. Alas, seeing her wan face, he only felt a throbbing in his heart. A nurse pushed the sick bed inside to transfer her over. However, a few attendants were not careful enough and used too much strength, and this resulted in her getting hurt. The still unconscious woman frowned at this. Disgruntled, he shouted, You've hurt her! The group of people was stunned and frightened in place for a moment. Clumsy things! Scram! His mood was extremely volatile. Pushing the sick bed away, he personally carried the sleeping woman in his embrace. He was ever so gentle and careful, as if she were the world's most precious treasure, as he held her in his embrace. His hands firmly supported her weight. As if his embrace brought her a great sense of relief, she intuitively snuggled closer to his chest. Her refined little face burrowed deep into his embrace, and her brows gradually eased from frowning. Because of the reliance perceived from her action, he calmed down. Somewhere in his heart, softened in that instant. Was her unconscious movement considered as dependency? Lowering his gaze onto her peaceful and gentle face, his lips could not help but arch in contentment. He liked this feeling. He truly liked this feeling of deep dependency from the woman in his embrace. He wanted to become the man she depended on for all her life, the one and only. Indeed, he cherished her. He tightened his hold on her, but it was only for a little, as he was afraid that he would accidentally hurt her if it were too tight. Still, his firm hold spoke volumes of his unwillingness to let her go. Hugging her like this, he strode to where the intensive care unit was. The crowd behind the two looked at one another in astonishment. Was there Senior Lewis smiling earlier? Gracia arrived at the appointment place. It was said that the annual membership fee of Avenue Commune could go as high as tens of millions. The VIP members of Avenue Commune were no doubt rich and prominent individuals. Without a multi-billion net worth, 
one would be unqualified to set foot in this place. Who invited her here? What was the person's identity? She pursed her lips in slight trepidation. Earlier, the attachments in the mail were the actual results of her maternity tests. If those reports were to reach the Lewis family's hands, she did not dare to think what fate would be waiting for her. Regardless, be it as a friend or foe, she still had to meet this person. For this person to threaten her over the mail meant there was no room for negotiation. It proved that she had value of use to the person. Her thinking was very meticulous and quickly thought up to this level. Solely relying on the address dated in the mail, she pushed the door open to a luxurious room. Feeling slightly stunned, she closed the door at once. The soundproofing of this private clubhouse was excellent. This private clubhouse's high level of secrecy was also why many big shots would conduct their business dealings here. She walked in as she surveyed her surroundings. On the coffee table was a stack of documents. When her eyes landed on them, she frowned slightly. She was a little curious about what they were. Taking in a deep breath of cold air, she scanned her surroundings again, before she carefully made her way to that stack of documents and proceeded to pick them up. At a sweep of her eyes, she completely froze, as if struck by lightning. The contents of these documents were nothing else but her identity. Bluntly put, this was an extremely detailed investigation report about her background. From the identity of her biological parents and her contact details to her personal information, everything was clearly listed in detail. Still, how did these reports appear here? Had she not bribed people to destroy them? She clearly remembered having these documents destroyed. Even her DNA sample no longer existed in the Jeans Bank. So all the pieces of evidence that would expose her identity should have been eliminated already. The doctor who had performed the maternity test on her also went abroad. How, then, did these reports end up here? What could be the motive of the person who had arranged to meet her here? Was it... Did that doctor hide a copy? Impossible. They had signed a confidentiality agreement. Besides, she had given that person a hefty sum of money. It was enough for him to live in luxury for the rest of his life. Who could it be, then? She swept her eyes across the information. This information, which was evidence against her, was something she absolutely wanted to destroy. Who was it? Just who exactly could it be? Who on earth held the door to her destiny. Episode 353 The Big Shot Behind the Scenes Part 1 Would Gracia be threatened? The further she thought of it, the more fearful she became. A frightening chill climbed from her toes all the way to her head. Her face paled in an instant, and her fingertips trembled uncontrollably. Her hands shook so much, she dropped documents to the floor. Her chest undulated non-stop. Apparently, she was still in shock. Struggling to take control of her emotions, she slowly crouched to pick up the scattered sheets of paper. Behind her suddenly came the deep voice of a man. Shocked at the sight of these documents... The abrupt voice was deep and low, yet it fell on her ears like a thunderclap in this quiet room. She yelped in surprise and swiftly pivoted to look in the direction of the voice with wide eyes. From a corner of the meeting room, she saw a man in a suit slowly make his way to her. The face buried in the shadows was exposed under the room's bright lights. Each step of the man toward her made her breath stifle in alarm. The fear gradually receded, and its place was the wariness of the man. Standing in front of her was an unfamiliar forty-something man. Expensive fabric clothed his extraordinary stature. With his aristocratic aura, 
He was effortlessly elegant. One could tell at a glance that he was a wealthy, respectable person. The man's footsteps halted. She trembled in trepidation as her guarded vision landed on his face. Although the man was nearing old age, she could still see traces of his past handsome features. The sharp features and handsome profile were alike Peter Lewis's to some degree. She found his face to be somewhat familiar, but could not recall it right now. Just where exactly had she seen this man? She had a feeling that he was someone known to her, but she could not really identify the man. She tried hard to recall, but it was to no avail. Seeing the doubts written on her face, the middle-aged man laughed. That laughter had the spirit of an elderly man with a high position. He looked straight at her, opened his mouth, and his mild voice, the one used specifically on the younger generation, came pouring out. Why? Don't you recognize me? His questioning got to her. You are a little familiar. Who are you? She narrowed her eyes skeptically at him, still keeping hold of the weariness in her heart. A straightforward question, without honorifics. Frowning at her lack of manners, he sneered and put his answer on hold. Instead, he periodized sitting down on the sofa, pouring himself a cup of tea and taking a sip of it. His calm demeanor and elegant mannerisms revealed him to be a man of power and position in the high society. At his casualness, she found herself in a quandary. She helplessly stood in place, at a loss on what to do. He did not speak, so she did not dare to speak to. Clutching that remaining stack of documents in her hand, the ongoing silence made her so tense she broke into a cold sweat. Why are you so nervous? The man raised his head, and seeing her guarded look, he laughed. Am I a tiger? Don't worry, I'm not going to eat you. Sit. His face and voice matched to a T, the sort of kindness and maturity an elderly man should have. Compared to him, she was consciously aware that her reaction was childish. Still, there was some hesitation inside her. Sit down. I won't do anything to you. If I wanted to harm you, you would long cease existing in this world. The middle-aged man smiled kindly at her. The last part of his words terrified her to no end. If I wanted to harm you, you would long cease existing in this world. What did he mean by that? She understood a few points. First, this man was so powerful, he could crush her effortlessly. Second, this man held the door to her destiny, enough to be capable of ordering her death. Third, this man, at least for now, was not her enemy. As for whether he was a friend or foe, that was something to be decided later. Her restless heart calmed down a little. She sat on the sofa and carefully observed him and his every move in secret. By the time the man finished his cup of tea, fifteen minutes had already passed, yet he was still in no hurry to talk. It was unknown if he was purposely keeping her in suspense, but he proceeded to pour himself another cup of tea and sample it unhurriedly. Even after drinking three cups of tea in succession, he did not say a word to break the silence. In this suffocating silence, she was practically sitting on pins and needles. Seeing that he had drunk his third cup of tea and was about to pour his fourth, she lost her patience and carefully opened her mouth. You are... Young people are really impatient. It took you only three cups of tea to lose your patience. The middle-aged man snorted apparently dissatisfied with her impatience. You! Were you the sender of that mail? She carefully worded her words politely. Inside, she was a little in awe of this man. He smiled faintly and opened his mouth to remind her. In accordance to seniority, you should be calling me Fourth Uncle. Fourth Uncle? She was nonplussed. Suddenly, she jerked on her seat. Fourth uncle. Was that? 
Ronald Lewis? Her grandpa had a third wife. In this rank, Richard Lewis was second, and the third wife's son, Ronald Lewis, was fourth. It was just that Peter Lewis had always put emphasis on legitimacy. This man was a bastard. Thus, he, together with his mother, lived in the Lewis residence in the South Capitol. Speaking of the Lewis residence, there were five mansions in total. The main residence of the Lewis was, of course, located at the heart of the capital, while the rest were in the north, south, east, west, respectively. The four branch mansions housed the four bastards and other collateral relatives of the Lewis. Only the direct descendants were qualified to live in the main residence. Fourth uncle. Would this man be Ronald Lewis? She pondered on this for a moment before she tentatively voiced out his name. Lewis. Ronald? Impudent. His face changed as he shoved a cup of tea on the table. With a bang, the tea splashed everywhere, startling her. His eagle eyes pierced into her. With a livid face, he berated, Are you qualified to call me by my name directly? You don't know any courtesy. She promptly bowed her head in guilt. I apologize. I don't know any etiquette. Fourth uncle. Hello, fourth uncle. This man was definitely Ronald Lewis. She suddenly recalled seeing him in the Lewis family portrait. In it, this man was standing to the left of her grandfather. At the time the portrait was made, the man's face was still young. Hence, she failed to recognize him for a moment. The anger on his face had yet to ebb. Unseemly. I was in the wrong, fourth uncle. This is my first time meeting you in person. Your presence overwhelmed me. So I was accidentally discourteous. Please forgive me. She offered her sincere apology and put forth the good etiquette she had learned as a member of the Lewis family. She had heard that Ronald Lewis was a vicious character. She did not dare to offend him so easily. Episode 354, The Big Shot Behind the Scenes, Part 2 Huh, Ronald snorted. Do you know why I called you over? Gracia was frightened for a moment. It turned out that the sender was really him. What motive did he have? She upped her guard. He saw through her with one look and coldly mocked. You're still too young to play subtle tease with me. You don't really need to be on guard against me. After all, we have a common interest. What do you mean? Her face paled as she raised her eyes to look at him puzzledly. Could you speak a little clearer? Gracia, you've seen the documents earlier. Deciding not to beat around the bush, he went straight to the point. Instantly, her face took a ghastly look as guilt assailed her. Caught in a fit, she chose to remain silent. It's useless trying to hide anything from me. Do you really think that you can keep your deeds a secret? I'm not Peter Lewis, a useless fool who's still being kept in the dark by you. He's already old. If he were still that Peter Lewis from two decades ago, this little trick of yours would easily be uncovered. His words indiscriminately pricked her face with thick icicles. Her lips trembled. Scared witless, she asked. You? What do you know? Are you asking me what I know about you? As if he had just heard a great joke, he amusedly lit a cigar, sucked a mouthful of it, and slowly spat it out. He then got up and walked to the bedside. With his back facing her, he slowly spoke. I know your biological mother is a masseur. The moment you were born, she abandoned you at the hospital gate. Later, you were adopted by a kind couple. These adoptive parents, unfortunately, got killed in a car accident, and you were sent to Home Care Welfare Center. Then fail. This name should be very unfamiliar to you. 
At that time, you have it good in the welfare center. And to gain the status, snacks, and beautiful clothes you wanted, you didn't hesitate to spread your legs for the director. You were such a young girl, yet you already knew how to sell your body in exchange for benefits. When Monica was sent to the welfare center, she witnessed you and the director in the middle of it. That's why you tried chasing her away. You stole her jade pendant, originally wanting to sell it off. Unexpectedly, before this could happen, the Lewis came looking for the missing daughter of Elizabeth and mistakenly acknowledged you. When you were 29, Peter Lewis had you undergo maternity testing. You didn't hesitate to bribe the doctor with a tidy sum to falsify the result and forced him to go abroad. Realizing that Monica is Elizabeth's real daughter, you hooked up with Mark and hired assassins to eliminate her and Andres. Every word this man uttered was like a poison blade that pierced through her body. Her face gradually lost its color. With its paleness, it was truly a tragic sight to behold. Suddenly, she smiled sinisterly and turned to gaze coldly at her flat stomach. The child you have in your stomach now should be Mark's. You're with him, yet still want to keep your status in the Lewis family. My words are spot on. Right? Her face plummeted further. With a crestfallen face, she sank her weight on the couch. She seemed to have lost her spirit as her eyes, full of utter disbelief, stared vacuously ahead of her. Every word he had spouted was the truth. If that was the case, where did he get all his information from? She had always been very careful. So when did he find out about her? Unless someone has betrayed me? Is it the doctor? Or is it... Mark? She frowningly ruminated on this. Now, everyone close to her was suspicious in her eyes. No one has betrayed you. Apparently, the man could tell what was on her mind. I have a rough idea of your present standing. I'm different from you. I don't fight a losing battle. Do you think I'm also someone who lacks foresight? It's impossible. What's impossible? He laughed. Are you implying that it's impossible for me to know all this in the first place? Speechless at his retort, she could only clench her fist silently. She was always careful. So how did he find out? Ah, uh, you're really too naive. The Lewis family isn't as simple as you think. He jested. Peter Lewis has grown old. He can't see things clearly now. It's not unusual for him to make mistakes at his age. Do you really think that you've covered all your traps? I had all the reports destroyed. Where did this come from? She glared intensely while she lifted the stack of reports. These aren't the reports that you ordered to be destroyed. He simply replied. She felt alarmed but was unable to fathom what he meant. Where did these reports come from, then? His next reply shocked her thoroughly. Don't you know? Peter Lewis had two DNA tests done on you. What? She was flabbergasted. Glaring at the man in front of her, she demanded, How could I possibly not know of Grandpa doing that? With a snigger, he mercilessly mocked her. Oh, don't be so cozy in calling him Grandpa. Don't you forget that you're an imposter. A mere interloper. I... Feeling dumbfounded, she was at a loss on what to say next. In any case, regardless of her identity, she wanted to get to the bottom of this. Did Peter Lewis really do two DNA testing on me? He took a drag on his cigar and exhaled the billowing smoke on her anxious face, sand the reservation. Yeah. <laughs> the smoke from the cigar choked her and sent her into a coughing fit. His words shot forth like a bolt of lightning. The first time he had done the test was not long after you had arrived at the Lewis household. At that time, you were running a fever. He conveniently took some blood samples of yours to do the test on the way to the hospital. How is that possible? <laughs> Struggling to suppress her coughing, she continued to probe with a frown. 
If he had really done that, then he should have known that I'm an imposter. I would have been thrown away long before. He must be fooling me. Fooling you? He could not stop sniggering. You are truly funny. I thought you have some smarts in you, but boy, was I wrong. Tell me then, if he had done it long before, why had he repeated it again when I was eighteen? He studied her flustered face, swept his eyes across the crumpled files in her clenched fist, and smilingly replied, Where do you think the reports in your hands have come from? She seemed to come about at his cool retort. Her head jerked abruptly in his direction, her eyes looking at him incredulously. Episode 355 What Motives Does He Have? Yes, yes, yes. Gracia stared straight at Ronald. The astonishment in her eyes and the terror in her bones could not be concealed. Well, registering her quaking lips and temporary inability to form a coherent statement, he was thoroughly amused. Did this scare her already? The skills of this girl, when compared to him, were far too shallow. She peered at his cold face and asked in bafflement, Was it done by you? He expelled the smoke in his mouth and frankly admitted, I only did the same thing that you did. His meaning could not be any clearer. Back then, Peter Lewis had done a maternity test on her, and since it was done in the private hospital controlled by Ronald, getting his hands on the real report was no hassle. It was just that his methods were more vicious than hers. Bribing the doctor, performing the DNA testing with a hefty sum, she signed a confidentiality agreement with him, and then sent him abroad. He, on the other hand, manipulated that doctor into falsifying the DNA test result and then had him assassinated without a trace left. It was a clean job. Hence, even today, Stefan was unable to find out about it. He knew that her DNA test report was forged, yet he was too late to find the witness. Well, the person was already dead, with his body burned into ashes. So how could he find him? Afterward, a different doctor that was bribed by her traveled across the sea and landed on the U.S.'s shores. He was worried that the doctor's mouth was not secure enough, and he knew that with Stefan's methods, the young man would eventually track everything back to him. His nephew's methods were more ruthless than his. What of her bribing the doctor? That young chap had all sorts of means to make that doctor confess. Thus, he sent someone after that doctor and had him eliminated as well. He then commanded for the doctor's body to be thrown at the sea, sans a trace. While the living could be forced to make a confession, the dead could surely not open their mouths to talk. She was deterred by the viciousness in his eyes. Her breathing suddenly sped up, and she found it hard to calm down. She knew in her heart that Ronald was a vicious character. At the age of nine, when she had first set foot into the Lewis residence, this matter was still unknown among the Lewis family. He had her real report in his hands, which meant that, before this, he was already aware of her identity. At least it meant that this man was astute and true to a frightening degree. She felt more fearful toward him. This man was too scary. Feeling the documents in her hands, this meant that she already held all the evidence against her. This man seemed to have anticipated this. Perhaps for a certain purpose, he wanted to use this to threaten her into serving him. Just based on these documents? She took a closer look at the documents in her hands. The doctor's signature was authentic. It seemed to be the original files. Was this man old and muddled too? Such important documents easily landed on her. In her state of dismay, she came up with an extreme thought. Since the evidence was in her grasp, if she did not destroy them now, when else would she do so? Would she wait for this man to threaten her? No way. She moved to tear the files into pieces at once, crumpled the torn pieces into a ball, and then set everything on fire using the lighter she had forgotten from the table. 
Ronald was calmly standing before the window all this while. Watching her drastic movements, he seemed indifferent toward them. In this way, he let her light up and burn the original documents. The fire quickly engulfed the sheets of paper with data and turned them into ashes. She flung her hands and allowed the burning scraps to scatter all over the floor and scorch through the expensive rug in this room. With a sinister look, she watched the important evidence be reduced into ashes. Seeing the floor covered in suit and cinder, her lip flaps curled up to reveal her pearlescent teeth as she smugly laughed. <laughs> Gracia raised her head smugly at him and said through gritted her teeth, Just from this? Are you honestly threatening me with just this alone? No. I'll see how else you can threaten me. His face surprisingly remained tranquil as she performed her seemingly maddening act. In his eyes, a hint of pity and contempt fleeted through. Seeing that frosty calmness on his face, she stopped laughing and her facial expression cooled off. What? How could he look so calm in the face? She destroyed the evidence. Could it be that he was unmoved by that? Otherwise, did he still have a handle over her? You? Do you really think that burning all those files will let you rest easy? He gently stubbed out the cigar on an ashtray and lazily lifted his smiling, yet not smiling eyes. He appeared to be mocking her ignorance. What do you mean? She suddenly found him to be too incomprehensible. Thinking back now, her actions moments before indeed looked impulsive and naive. From the very start, those documents had been placed on the spot she could easily see them. What did he mean? Did it mean that they were not at all important to him? Or were they perhaps not the original copies? No need to doubt. Those were the only real copies of the evidence. As if he could read her mind, he coldly clarified that. Still, do you think that by burning the original documents, you can burn away all the evidence? She suddenly paled from shock and asked Atkins, She's keeping my blood sample? Not too stupid after all. He snorted at her contemptuously. Even if I don't have your blood sample, so what? You can indeed easily destroy this evidence. What do you know what the biggest evidence is? It is of course the blood in your body. Can you turn your blood into Elizabeth's? Her face turned white instantly. That was true. The blood running through her veins was solid proof. How could she be this stupid? She was too naive. She thought too highly of herself. Uh, I... The middle-aged man pressed the bell. A few moments later, someone rushed into the room and replaced the charred rug with a new one. She stood stiffly in spot. This went on until he returned to the sofa. Gracia, I advise you not to struggle anymore. You standing on the same side as me is your only protection from this. What motives do you have? She sat across from him, trying to soothe her frightened self. My motives? I thought you are clear about them. Lewis family... The position as Lewis family had? Gracia stared at his face as she spoke one at a time. Episode 356 My nephew is no idler. Ronald laughed coldly, his voice like hard ice. This position is supposed to belong to me. I'm only taking back what is supposed to be mine. Stefan won't give it up to you. She pursed her lips. That's even more so since he's the most viable candidate for the position as the Lewis family's head. With a curl of his lips, he cruelly answered, That's why I need to get rid of him. Get rid of him? Her heart stifled as she yelled. No! Huh? You can't get rid of him! face flushed in agitation. He mocked. Why? 
Are you still daydreaming to be the Lewis family's young mistress? Just like a bloody sword, his sarcasm pierced right through her heart. He continued to ridicule her. Or is it that you still love the man? You! She bit her lower lip. Yes, she still loved the man deeply. Loved and hated. She believed that her love for this man was more than, and never lesser, of Monica's. She had once loved him foolishly and madly. Alas, the man did not reciprocate it. Don't be silly. He'll never marry you. Cold sarcasm seeped into his voice. She frowned, but did not speak a word. Leaning slightly backward, he said in a low voice, This nephew of mine, just like his father, values family and friends more than anything. Once he acknowledges the one he loves, he'll never give it up. His heart has no place for you, and only that girl named Monica. You can stop having illusions about the position of the Lewis family's young mistress. It's nothing more than wishful thinking. Sooner or later, he will be fond of me. The love I have for him is no lesser than that bitch. She howled in rage. Fond of you? He laughed. Naive. Do you think that he doesn't know of your parlor trick? This is where you're stupid. Scheming under his nose. Do you really think that that nephew of mine is an idler? Still, even if he knows, what can he do to me? She argued. What of Stefan knowing what she did? With Peter Lewis as her shield, what could he do to her? Ronald flatly pointed out. Indeed, with that old man standing on your side, you're safe. But think about it. How much longer can that old man live? She was struck by his words. What he had said was indeed true. Her position in the Lewis family now was wholly reliant on that old man's protection. Once he was no longer around, she would be all alone, with no one to rely on but that big Lewis family. When he saw her wavering look, he added the last stroke of fire. Once he's dead, your time will soon be upon you too. My nephew isn't going to let you live. Her gaze turned blank as she became terrified. You're lying. He won't kill me. He was not him. His methods would not be so cruel. He nodded at her words as he dragged his words out. That's true. He'll just let you lead a life worse than death. Fourth uncle, what do you mean by this? He scoffed. Huh. You're defending him even now. Yet you don't wonder what has made you become like this. What do you mean? What did those words mean? This old thing always said his words halfway and left people hanging. Seeing the perplexity on her face, he slowly revealed in his deep voice, Do you really think that your pregnancy is an accident? I thought that I am infertile, so I didn't take any precautions. Her face was flushed as she gritted out these words. You don't have any congenital infertility. He laughed. That's no more than a trap set up by my nephew. At his words, her expression froze, and the corner of her brows twitched severely. <laughs> You're saying that the infertility report from six years ago was forged by him. I guess you don't know about this at all. Like a thunderclap, she stared at him with incredulity and shock in her eyes. It's impossible. You're no more than a pawn to him. What infertility? It's all fake. I pity that you're full of affection for him while being played by him all along. Gracia, how pathetic you are. She clenched her fists tightly. Every word of him was steadily destroying her psychological defense. She took in a deep breath, closed her eyes, and then opened them again. This time, they were cold and boundless. Fourth uncle, it seems that I still have some use in your eyes. Not wrong. Is it because Peter Lewis dotes on me? Yes. He slowly stood up. 
This old man, even though his body is deteriorating, the power of the Lewis family is still in his hands. You're the only one who can get close to him and the Lewis family. If I help you, what benefits do I get? He answered, I'll give you a lifetime of inexhaustible wealth and glory. Huh. Not enough, she suddenly smirked. Before I help you, I want you to get rid of two people for me. Oh. Monica and Andres. She gnashed her teeth as she dragged out each word. Special Care Unit Monica slowly opened her eyes. The moment she did so, her left eye stung at the corner. A patch of blood was before her. Startled, she shut her eyes tightly and slowly sat up from the bed. Her half-opened right eye swept across the ward. She suddenly realized that, at her bedside, Sam was tightly clutching her hand as he lay on the bed, seemingly fast asleep. Meanwhile, Stefan was on the right side of her sick bed. His warm palm was tightly holding her hand as his firm arm propped his head. His eyes were closed, and it seemed that he had fallen asleep as well. His black fringe hit his eyelids. A few stray strands dangled at his slightly furrowed brows, highlighting his fear face. The father and son were holding each hand of hers on either side. The warmth from their palms spread from her fingertips to her heart and seemed to chase away the coldness in the ward. She was originally having a severe headache. However, seeing the father-son pair at her sick bed as soon as she opened her eyes, even this most severe pain of hers subsided a little. The corners of her lips could not help but curve into a gentle smile. The door to the ward suddenly being pushed open slightly from the outside startled her. Following which, Andres walked in while balancing two heavy hot water kettles in his hands. His mouth had a shopping bag full of bread. Lifting his eyes, he saw her sitting upright with her back leaning against the headboard. He raised a brow in her direction, and then his eyes widened in relief. Putting down all the things on him, he was about to speak when he saw her mouth for him to be silent. <laughs> Seeing her careful expression... The hand movements also softened. He lightly crept up to her bedside and softly called out to her. Mommy, you're awake. Yes. When did you wake up? He had just stepped out to get hot water and buy bread and snacks from the convenience store below the hospital for a bit. Episode 357, The Virtuous Andres Just woke up. You've been unconscious for a whole day and night. It's good that you're awake now. A whole day and night? Why was she unconscious for so long? The doctor said that mommy has a slight concussion. Um, so... Andres carefully moved a stool and sat on her right. Taking out an apple... He began to shave off the skin bit by bit with a knife. Puzzled, Monica asked, How did I end up in the hospital? Stupid mommy. You got hurt, of course. You needed to be sent to the hospital. A helpless look appeared on the little lad's face. What's more, your injury is a little serious and needs you to recuperate properly. He purposely sat on the right because of her left ear's perforation. This was in case his mother could not hear his voice clearly from the left. Just as her admission procedures to the hospital were completed, Stefan brought him and Sam over. Initially thinking that she had suffered a grievous injury, he was incessantly plagued with worries and desirous to grow wings to fly to her side. Then, after arriving at the hospital, he heard the doctor say that she got injured during filming. External forces had caused her eardrum to be damaged, and it would take a few days for her to recuperate. A little restless still, he kept asking about her condition. Only after the doctor had assured him a few times that it would not leave a permanent damage, did he finally feel relieved. Naturally, 
His father did not tell him of the true situation. He did not know what bloodbath the little demon would stir up otherwise. The man sensed that the boy, although pure and harmless on the surface, seemed to have a sealed demon inside his heart. The moment his bottom line was touched, the demon in his heart would awaken. The boy's mother happened to be his untouchable bottom line, his reverse scale. He did not doubt that if the little lad learned the truth, besides tearing apart the forbidden love troop, he would cause havoc in Foxcom as well. Nonetheless, he knew that this matter could not be kept under wraps for long. His only hope was to deal with this matter personally. Sam was even more worried and afraid than his twin. When he first entered the ward, his mother was still unconscious. The moment he saw her swollen face, tears streamed down his face, and he proceeded to hug her arm while he cried his eyes out in heartache for her. His younger twin stood at the side and calmly assessed her situation with a heavy face. Countless suspicions flashed through his eyes. Just as the man was starting to think that he had found something fishy, the boy stepped forward and pushed Sam away to keep vigil over her. With righteous indignation, he said, You're forbidden from taking advantage of my mommy. Hm. That's my mommy too. Unwilling to back down, his older twin reminded him. Andre snorted. With that, the two little guys fought over it. This resulted in their father feeling troubled by this. Finally, he could bear it no longer. He flicked them on their foreheads. Your mommy is still lying on the sick bed. If you want to fight, do that outside. You two can come in once you're done. Seeing that he had gotten angry, the two boys settled down. They decided not to cause a ruckus anymore with a handshake. They internally made up their minds to have a temporary truce and get along friendly, at least for their mommy's sake. The father and sons then took turns to guard her through the night. She narrowed her eyes at Andres' tender and fair face and asked Askin, Andres, did you bully your big brother? Mommy, I'm innocent. Andres doesn't anyhow bully children. He cried out softly, his hand movements never once stopping. Really? Really? While he spoke, he ably peeled the apple's skin with a small knife. Thereafter, he cut it into small slices. Picking up a piece with a fork, he delivered it into her mouth. Come, Mommy. She opened her mouth and bit the juicy fruit, which left a sweet taste in her tongue. Mmm, it's so sweet. Of course it's sweet. They're all personally handpicked by Andres. A blissful smile was hanging on his lips. What a clever boy. She could not help but laugh gently. Mommy, are you hungry? Andres bought all your favorite food. There's the custard bun that you love, yam cream cake, green bean pastry. He listed off all the food one by one as he placed each on the table, acting as if he were a virtuous wife and a loving mother. This son really knew his mother best. Not only did he know that she was starving, he also chose every favorite food of hers. Feeling extremely touched, she looked at her beloved son. At this moment, the boy seemed to be swathed by a holy light. The boy raised his eyes, only to see her looking at him reverently. Mommy, why do I feel that you're taking me for Mother Mary? He asked Riley. Andres, Mommy loves you so much. Mommy, you clearly love the custard bun and yam cream cake. He ridiculed again. Oh, Andres... Life is already tough, so let's not expose the truth. Don't expose Mommy. The corner of his eyes began to droop as he said dejectedly, Andres is sad. Mommy clearly loves custard buns more than she loves Andres. The side of her lips twitched furiously. What were the boundaries for one to be jealous? No matter what it was, even if it was just food, he would also feel jealous. This was beyond extreme. Andres, you're so easily jealous. Who asked for Mommy to be placed first in Andres' heart? He snorted, 
a doting smile gracing his lips. He then tore open the packaging of the custard bun. Cutting the bread with his knife, he fed the delicate pieces to her one by one. She was so touched, her heart was ready to melt at any moment. This was probably the pinnacle of happiness. She suddenly felt very emotional. Thus, she blurted out, Andres, don't get a wife in the future anymore. Just be with mommy forever. His lips curved into a loving arch as his eyes grew gentle. He replied simply, Okay. She smiled lightly at his easy acquiescence. Mommy's just joking. Don't take it to heart. Andres is taking it to heart. He continued his actions of placing a straw into the milk bottle before he lifted his gentle gaze on her. Andres will be mommy's forever supporter. She was stunned into temporary speechlessness. She knew that he was extremely reliant on her. She did not realize that it was bone deep. Is that not okay? He chuckled at the astonishment he observed on her face. Mommy... You should feel honored to have such a handsome son taking care of you for your entire life. Oh, it's fine. I know that Andres will find someone to love next time. She tried to motivate him a little. There won't be one. Fiddling with the straw in his small hand, his eyebrows twitched. I said it before. Mommy's place in Andres' heart is irreplaceable. She furrowed her brows and pursed her lips at his declaration. This child was still young, so she was the one he relied on the most. He would not be this way once he was older. He was still a young boy and had yet to receive enlightenment. It was still too early for him to understand the concept of romantic love. Episode 358 United Against Common Enemy, Part 1 Little guy, mommy loves you so much. Let mommy pinch your cheeks. Monica pulled her hand out of Stefan's grip to pinch each of her son's delicate cheeks. She was neither harsh nor gentle. Andre's face did not show a hint of resistance to her action. Instead, he affectionately said, Mommy, you're so energetic. You don't seem to be an injured patient at all. Mommy isn't a patient in the first place. Mommy, gentler, gentler. As the mother and son bickered, the man's shoulders shook fervently for a split second. Feeling the loss of warmth in his palm, he was jolted awake from his sleep. The man lifted his head as his cold eyes opened wide. The moment his blurry vision refocused, he saw her hugging her son as she pinched his cheeks wantonly. Andre showed no signs of resistance to this, though. Nestling in her arms contentedly, he let her pinch and rub his cheeks however she wanted, while producing melodious and soft giggles. A warm smile spread on the little lad's face, which was as fair as porcelain. Witnessing this, the man's anxious heart gradually eased. Earlier, he had a dream. In his dream, he was standing with her on a single log bridge. Under the bridge were the gushing waves of a river. He held onto her hand tightly as he cautiously walked across it. Suddenly, her grip loosened, and she fell off the bridge into the waters below. He awoke with a start, only to realize that it was nothing but a nightmare at the sight of the mother-son pair. It was a false alarm. Sam was also jolted awake by the pair's bickering. Raising his sleepy head, his sight was greeted by the duo embracing and horsing around. He flushed slightly as his dashing brows knitted. Mommy, he called out with a brittle voice. She shifted her gaze from her younger son to her older son. Seeing that he was awake, her eyes turned into crescents as she gently said, Sam, you're awake. Uh-huh. He pursed his lips shyly upon the realization that he had fallen asleep and said guiltily, I'm with mommy this whole time. I was just a bit tired, so I accidentally fell asleep. She was deeply touched by his claim. At the same time, she also felt a little heartache for him. 
You must be tired. Do you want to sleep some more? No. I want to accompany Mommy now. Does your face hurt still, Mommy? He came close to his mother. A pair of large and glistening eyes blinked at her as he inspected the swollen half of her face. The swelling has subsided a little, but it is still swollen. It must be painful, Andres pouted indignantly. Speaking of which, stupid mommy, what happened to you? How did your face end up like this from just filming a show? After a pause, his eyes slowly narrowed, and he asked suspiciously, Could it be that there's someone on set bullying mommy? Her smile stiffened. Inside her, Sam also voiced out his suspicion. I also find it to be strange. Daddy said that mommy had gotten hurt during filming. I don't believe that at all. It's obvious that there is a handprint on mommy's face. Someone seemed to have hit her. Uh-huh. I saw it too. Five bloody finger marks. Mommy, is there someone on set bullying you? The two little boys approached her with an air of suspicion. The two palm-sized faces came up close. Their bright eyes were filled with doubt as they looked at her. Her heart thumped in her chest. These two little guys had such sharp instincts. Who bullied you, Mommy? Say it, and I will bully them back worse. I too, I too. With us here, who would dare to lay a finger on you? The two brothers stood at the bedside with their arms around each other's shoulders. At this point, they were united against a common enemy. They shared the same look of readiness to avenge her for the injustice she had received. The two shared the same mind. Regardless of their competition for her affection in the past, they were allies now, echoing each other's thoughts. Their parents shared a look of amusement at their stern demeanor. Stop fooling around. We're not fooling around. Yeah, yeah, we're not fooling around. Sam chimed in. Andres clenched his fist tightly. With sullen eyes, he said, rather indignantly, Mommy got bullied, so we must help Mommy get back her dignity. The older twin mimicked his actions and repeated angrily, Yeah, help Mommy get back her dignity. Let them know what the consequences are for bullying Mommy. Yeah, what the consequences are. Bullying my mommy is intolerable, the younger twin said furiously. Yeah, intolerable. The other turned his gaze on his older brother unhappily and chastised. Stupid, stop copying my words. I didn't copy your words. You did, I heard you. You're like a parrot, which only knows how to copy people's words. It's you who's like a parrot. You're the parrot. It's you who's the parrot. Parrot! Parrot! Stupid! Stupid! Big idiot! Invalid! Your invalidation is invalid! Your invalidation of my invalidation is invalid! The two boys were again caught up in their internal strife. With flushed faces, they were flinging words at each other. Their teeth were bared, and their claws were drawn. A full-on fight was breaking out. Stefan rubbed his forehead in frustration. They do. When will they ever get along peacefully? They were just united against a common enemy moments ago. Now they were back to disagreeing with each other bitterly. He walked over right away and grabbed the cuddly boys in each arm, admonishing in a deep voice, Stop fighting! Andres was not buying it. He folded his arms against his chest and snorted coldly, proceeding to ignore him by turning his face away. Sam, meanwhile, fell for it. Feeling extremely wrong, his eyes became downcast as tears began to pool at his eye rims. Daddy is so fierce. I don't want Daddy anymore. I want Mommy. He opened his arms to his mother, begging for a hug. Her heart instantly softened at that. Raising her arms, she moved to bring him into her embrace. At this, Andres was a little jealous. He struggled against his father's hold, hoping to be let down so that he could throw himself into her arms as well. 
Mommy's embrace was his territory, and he needed to safeguard it until the end. The man, unfortunately, was not planning to let him go. He clenched the kid's shoulders and redirected him into his embrace. Holding his handsome face close to his son's adorable face, he said, Andres, be good. Let Daddy hug you. I don't want your hug. The man's winsome eyes were laced with hurt and indignation. Why don't you want Daddy's hug? He was rarely this close to his older son, yet his younger son was just too unlike the other. He was aloof, docile, and proud. He was clearly teasing him on purpose. Andres raised his little hand and pushed the man's handsome face away from him. His face was filled with despise. Go away! I don't want your hug! I want mommy's! Episode 359, Lifted Up High Catching hold of his rebellious hands, the man's lips arched into a devilish smile. Stefan watched the boy's face take a red hue out of shyness. Even though the kid was saying no, he was not resisting and struggling much. Embarrassed and upset, the boy glared at him indignantly. He turned his face away, not wanting to look at him, as his pink lips pursed into a haughty arch. It was a silent resistance. This little boy was truly stubborn. Where had he inherited this proud personality from? He held the boy's chin and forced the latter to look at him. Andre struggled a little, trying to escape his grip. But who was he to triumph over his father's strength? Realizing that resistance was futile, he simply decided to give up. He stared at the man with threat in his eyes. The man smiled a little. This was his first time seeing his son's face up close. His jet black hair was silky smooth, and it shone under the light. His palm-sized face with rosy cheeks was fair like snow. Accentuating his adorable features were his high bridge nose and glistening round eyes, which upturned at the corner. These pupils were framed by curly and thick lashes. His black orbs were as clear as water, making them more tantalizing and dazzling like diamonds without an ounce of impurity. Indeed, Andres had inherited his mother's beautiful eyes and his father's distinctive facial features. He embodied all their positive physical attributes. There was no doubt that this little guy would soon grow up into a sophisticated, handsome man. The boy's face burned under his piercing stare. He glared back at him defiantly. Just like this, the father and son's eyes clashed with each other silently. Amused by the nervousness on the little lad's face, she could not help but laugh. Oh, Andres, what is with your expression? The boy's face turned even redder, and he awkwardly replied, He keeps staring at me. That's because Daddy loves you, right? He prompted. I don't want to be loved by him. He stubbornly replied, pouting begrudgingly thereafter. The man let out a laugh suddenly. Andres... You want to play a game with Daddy? What? It is Sam's favorite game. What? I don't want to play. Before he could finish his words, the man held his body firmly and tossed him slightly in the air. Oh! He screamed as his body hung suspended in the air for a brief moment before it fell on Stefan's waiting arms. Before he could utter a protest, the man tossed him gently in the air again. His expression changed into one of shock as he let out another shrill scream. Too high! It was too high! In the next moment, he was falling again. His heart seemed to stop beating for a moment. His heart was suddenly in his throat. As he fell once more, his father caught him firmly again. Both the man's arms went under the little boy's armpits as he held him aloft. Terrified, his complexion turned wan. His beautiful face was now entirely ashen. Put me down! Put me down! He struggled and crashed his cute little legs. The man's hands trembled a bit, causing the boy to let out another horrified scream. Oh my! I'm so... Just when he thought that he would hit the floor, 
His father once again caught him safely in his arms. Two rounds later, Andres, who was now drenched in sweat, was scared out of his wits. I don't want to play anymore! This is no fun! What kind of game was this? It was no fun at all! The boy glared at his father in indignation, afraid that he would throw him up again. He held tightly onto his clothes as he bit his lower lip with force. The man raised a brow at the sight of his pale and terrified face. This was probably the difference between the two children. While Sam loved exciting games like this, Andres was terrified of them. He was careful not to toss him up too high for fear of the young boy's heart being unable to take it. In the end, he still scared the little rascal witless. Be good. Call me daddy. Huh. The boy was stubborn, sizing him up with narrowed eyes. He was unconvinced. I won't call. I won't call. Stupid. Stupid. He did not get to finish his words as the man tossed him anew in the air with a flip of his arms. The boy, trembling, covered his eyes in shock, letting out a frightful cry. Call me daddy. I won't. Seeing how stubborn he was being, he resolved to teach this proud son of his properly. Alas, not even two rounds later, the boy could no longer keep up his tough facade. With a dejected face, he wrapped his arms around his neck tightly and sobbed. <laughs> Daddy! The man was stunned. Turning his gaze onto him, he saw his son's eyes tightly shut as the latter clung onto him for dear life. He buried his face into his chest as his small, pliant body curled up into a ball. He was trembling in fear. Daddy, I don't want to play anymore. I'm scared. He earnestly whispered. His eyes brimmed with tears, while his mouth formed an unhappy pout. He had conceded defeat. The man's eyes softened, and so did his heart. He placed his palm on his head and gave it a light pat. Good boy. We will stop playing now. Andre squinted his eyes. He had truly been brought to tears by the scary experience. This game is no fun at all. It's so scary. He closed his eyes after saying that. Feeling wrong, big fat tears spilled from the corner of his eyes as he began to cry. The man was at a loss now. He gazed down at the boy in his arms, whose eyes had tears like pearls in them. These tears dripped onto his arms. Baffled, he furrowed his brows. Did he unintentionally make this little boy cry? He was a little helpless whenever he saw children cry. As such, right now, he was frantic to coax the boy out of his forlorn weeping. Don't cry. Don't cry, okay? Let Daddy hug you. The little lad pushed his father's handsome face away disdainfully, continuing to weep by himself miserably. Nothing the man did worked on him. It was deeply troubling whenever children cried. What was even more nerve-wracking was that Andres was the type that could not easily be bought into anything. He could only hug him tightly while he repeatedly pacified him. As she watched the ridiculous antics of the father-son pair, Monica's legs twitched furiously. Finally, when she saw the man pacifying the little lad in the same way he had done to her before, she burst into laughter. Sam raised his head and began to laugh as well when he saw the beautiful and gentle smile on her face. He had no idea what his mommy was laughing about, but seeing how pretty she looked with her infectious smile, he could not help but laugh along as well. Episode 360 Apologizing to Monica, Part 1 It was the father and son's turn to be dumbfounded. The two glared at Monica, with one looking displeased, and another feeling disgruntled. What's so funny? I was just thinking that you two are really adorable. She spoke frankly. Andre, still feeling wronged and unable to express himself properly, could only open his arms to her. Choking on his sobs, he said, Mommy, please hug Andres. Daddy isn't gentle at all. He's scared Andres. Sobbing in his tender voice, 
He generously complained to her about the man's violence. The man pursed his lips into a slight grimace. This little guy had indeed trained himself to the next level. While he was hostile when facing him, he was very docile when facing her. The difference in the way he treated them was simply biased. This little boy was wholly unfair. She was heartbroken. Come here. Mommy will give you a hug. Stop crying now. Hearing her calls, the boy pushed his father away at once and threw himself into her embrace. He burrowed his face deep into her chest happily. Seeing the way this young boy had buried his face into her chest, the man's face turned slightly ashen. This little boy really did not know the appropriate time and place to act coy. She failed to register his unhappiness, though. Dipping her head, she dropped a kiss between the little boy's brows before she gently coaxed, Andres, don't cry anymore, okay? Okay. Andres will listen to mommy. Following that, he ceased crying and smiled instead. Good boy. With just a few words, she was able to make the little boy giggle. The man's lips twitched furiously as he watched the two's interaction, sans his prior anger. As he registered the gorgeous smiles grazing the pair of lips, his chest inexplicably became filled with a soft and warm feeling. Sam hugged his father suddenly causing the latter to look down at him. He asked shyly, Daddy, do you like my little brother? Hearing his question, the man glanced at his younger son. Subconsciously, his eyes teemed with warmness. He lowered his head at once and replied, Yes, I like him. I like Mommy too. Sam's face quickly showed anxiety and doubt. Daddy, can we be like this forever? Stefan cocked his brow and then hummed in acknowledgement. Obviously, he did not really get the meaning behind the boy's question. The kid fiddled with his fingers timidly. His voice was muffled, yet it brimmed with hope. Daddy, I like this. The four of us together happily. Can we always be like this? Can we always be this way? Daddy, mommy, little brother and me. Let's stay together forever in a house. That way we can be happy every day. When the man remained mum, he thought that he was unwilling to do so. He quickly hugged his arm, pleading at him with an earnest look. The kid did not have his younger brother's way with words, yet the man still understood what he wanted. His eldest son wanted them to be a family of four and to be together forever. Is that okay? Sam really likes Mommy and Little Brother. Daddy, you also like Mommy and Little Brother. Can we be together forever and never be apart? Is that okay? The man nodded finally. Okay. As soon as he said that, the kid, pleasantly surprised, jumped in glee. Hooray, Daddy! Hooray! She raised her head and gave the embracing father-son pair a questioning gaze. Her focus was solely on Andres just then so she failed to hear the two's exchange. Smiling mysteriously, Sam said, It's a secret. Stefan had placed Pamela under temporary suspension ever since that slapping incident on set. Alas, ignorant to the seriousness of the matter, she was unafraid. After all, she still had her powerful backing. She refused to believe that the man would knock her down just because of Monica. He was just trying to scare her, that was all. Moreover, even if everybody were to claim that she had intentionally slapped the newbie, what could happen? Was there any evidence? What if there being several recordings of that scene? When the time came, she could claim that she had been too caught up in her acting, so she had failed to notice how hard she was slapping her co-actress. If the man tried to suppress her using the media, she could easily push this matter aside completely. With her status and fan base, how could she lose against a newly debuted actress? She consoled herself by saying that it was fine and that everything would be okay again after this ordeal was over. Inwardly, she could tell that the two's relationship was extremely good. Most men in the high society seemed to prefer pure and refined women like Monica. It was highly likely that Stefan was the newbie sugar daddy come supporter. Still, the possibility of the man being serious with that newcomer was practically non-existent. 
One must know that he was the crown prince of the capital's wealthiest family. Peter Lewis had already given his directive that actresses should not dream about entering his family registry. What did that mean? It meant that any women in show business had no right to marry into the Lewis family. Stefan was just playing around with Monica. Even if that newcomer was a vixen reincarnate, with her ability to seduce any type of man, what of it? The Lewis family threshold was too high. Would she be able to cross it? Did the man not have a fiancé already? Even though it may just be a title, no one would be able to change their relationship. If the man dared to protect the newcomer openly by knocking her down, there was no way that Peter Lewis would stand aside as news spread into the Lewis family. Nonetheless, every time Pamela thought of the way he had looked at the newcomer that day, coupled with his scarlet eyes and terrifying aura, she would lose just a bit of her confidence. She kept getting this feeling that Monica's place in that man's heart was not that superficial. Each time she thought of that, she still would feel some regret. If she had known that there was a relationship between the two, she would not have laid a finger on her, no matter what. Now she could only wait for this ordeal to blow over as fast as possible. James had handed over the recordings of that day's incident to make wealth. Stefan carefully went through them. His eyes gradually darkened as he watched them one by one. With a frosty look, his thin lips pressed into a grim line. The man's assistant watched from the sidelines with a furious frown. Deliberate. It had been deliberate. Those involved in the matter might be blinded to the truth, but those that were not could easily see it clearly. Pamela was probably still unaware of exactly how much strength she had used. Yet from an outsider's perspective... The crisp sounds of her slap were frighteningly loud. Just from watching that shocking scene, one could empathize to the scalding sensation of being slapped in the face. The actress had outrightly claimed that she had just been too caught up in her acting. But from a third party's eyes, it was clear that she had done it on purpose. I hope you enjoyed the episodes. Thank you for listening. See you on the next episodes. Please don't forget to share, like, and subscribe.